Chapter 1 Beulah was in her room, poring over the newest anatomy textbook she'd received by mail order, just the day before. Her entire life, she'd dreamed of being a doctor, but being a woman, and an orphan, she lacked the funds to even think about going to a medical school, so instead, she spent her free time studying textbooks so she could learn all about the human body. Her friends tended to think she should be having more fun than she did, but to her, studying medical texts was fun. She glanced up when her roommate entered the room, a strange look on her face. There's something strange happening around here, Catalina told her. I've been talking with Emmeline and Dorothy in the garden. Will you join us? Beulah looked at her friend, who was usually calm, and saw some slight panic in her eyes. Of course. I'm on my way. She carefully marked her spot in her book and stood up, smoothing her blue dress. The two friends walked together toward the garden at the back of the school. They lived in the dormitory of Madame Wig Foundling Home and School. Together, the two friends had grown up in the orphanage, and they now taught there. They had been roommates for as long as either of them could remember and tended to do things together as much as possible. Any idea what's wrong? There's a rumor Wiggy is sick, but no one can really substantiate it. Catalina looked worried, and that was unlike her roommate at all which made Beulah walk just a bit faster. There had been many rumors about Madame Wig, or Wiggy as she was known to everyone, dying over the years, but Catiline hadn't believed a single one. It seemed as if she believed this one. When they reached the garden, Beulah couldn't help but smile at their friend Dorothy, kneeling in the mud, pulling weeds. Gardening was a favorite pastime for Dorothy, and she grew most of the vegetables eaten by the school. As Dorothy reached for another weed, Beulah had to stop her. Be careful with that one. Will you make sure you keep the root intact, Dorothy? That one is Andropogon virginicus, and I think I can extract something from the leaves to make a tonic for the more rambunctious children. Do you mind? Dorothy exchanged a grin with Emmeline, and Beulah pretended she didn't see it. She knew her friends laughed about her behind her back, but she didn't care. They'd all be pleased when she found a way to keep the children calmer and more attentive to their studies. Dorothy nodded. I'm happy to. Are you going to try to grow it yourself? Yes, that's why I want the root intact. Although if it's like every other weed, I'm sure it will only grow where I don't want it to grow, Beulah said with a smile, determined to keep the conversation lighthearted. Just as Dorothy handed Beulah the plant, Wiggy herself walked over to them. She sat down on a large rock that was meant for decoration, but Beulah was certain the cost had been too high for removal, so it had just been left there, and arranged her skirts fussily. I'm not sure how much you girls have heard about my health. That got the attention of all four of the girls who were gathered in the garden to talk about Madame Wig's health. How could it not? Not much, Beulah replied softly. But enough that we're all concerned about you. How are you feeling? Wiggy let out a dramatic sigh. Well, the truth is, I'm not well at all. In fact, the doctor says that I'm dying. Beulah quickly zeroed in on the word doctor. What exactly did he say you're dying of? I should have known you'd be the one to ask me that, Beulah. You were always the one most interested in medicine. Wiggy shook her head. I'm not going to bore any of you with the details, except to say that I've been scrambling to make arrangements for all of you. You all know the principles that I live by, how I feel schools should be run, and now I want you to all spread all over the western half of this great country of ours. I want you to start schools there. Beulah frowned. But I intended to always teach here. I'm afraid with my impending demise, that just won't be possible. I've set up grants for each of you to start your schools with. If you can find a school already started where you can implement my ideas, that's even better. Now, let's talk about where you'll go. Wiggy pulled a newspaper from somewhere. Beulah stared at the paper, wondering how it had been concealed. Had Wiggy kept it in the back of her skirt? In her bosom, the possibilities were endless, and she couldn't keep her mind from racing from one thought to another. Where had the newspaper come from? Beulah, are you listening to me, or are you wool gathering? Wiggy asked. I never wool gather, Wiggy. I simply get lost in strange thoughts and wonder things no one else does. Wiggy raised an eyebrow at her oldest pupil, 
doing her best to set her in her place. It had worked once upon a time, but Beulah was no longer the little girl she'd been when she first came to the foundling home. I said that I would like each of you to find a mail-order groom from this newspaper. There are men spread all over the West, and I believe that you will each find love through it. She clapped her hands before her chest, grasping them together, allowing the newspaper to flutter to the dirt. I want you all to find happiness. And start schools to help you live on forever through your legacy? Catalina asked, looking a bit skeptical herself. That's right. Wiggy picked the newspaper back up, holding it out to Beulah. As the oldest, it should be Beulah's first pick of which man she wants to correspond with. Who will it be? Beulah didn't even want to touch the paper, not wanting a husband. In her life, she'd never had a man show any kind of interest in her. They'd be attracted to her not unpretty face, but then when she opened her mouth and started talking and her brains showed for what they were, they were no longer interested in her. Beulah's brain had always been her biggest handicap. Do I have to? Wiggy's eyes met hers, and Beulah remembered everything the woman had done for her, all the love she'd given her, and she knew. She took the paper and closed her eyes, pointing to the photograph of a man with dark hair. She could tell little else from the black and white photo, and she didn't care. She would marry the man if that's what Wiggy needed from her, but she had no desire. She read his name. I will correspond with Jack McLean. Good girl. Wiggy took the newspaper back and moved on to Catalina, but Beulah heard nothing else. She knew enough. Wiggy told them she was dying, though Beulah remained unconvinced, and she was expected to marry a stranger so she could start a school. She'd do it, but she'd do it grudgingly. With Beulah's near-perfect memory, she headed back to her dormitory so she could write a letter to Mr. McLean. Whether she wanted to do it or not, she'd agreed, and she would see it through. She never went back on her word. Never. She sat down at the small desk she shared with Catalina and began writing. Dear Mr. McLean. Jack McLean took the letter his mother was holding out. He was the youngest of seven sons, and he was set to inherit the ranch that he'd grown up on. As soon as he married, it would all be his. But he wasn't quite certain he was ready to marry and inherit yet. He enjoyed being able to do whatever he wanted to do, and once a wife was involved, that would be much harder. What is this? he asked, looking at his mom and knowing she had the answer. The seventh son and his family always had a special power and his was the ability to tell when someone was lying to him. His mother frowned at him, but told the truth, because she knew there was no point not admitting what she'd done. I sent away for a mail-order bride for you. This is the first letter you've received. Jack closed his eyes and counted to ten, slowly. His mother took things upon herself more than he thought she should. Why? Because it's time for you to marry and start a family. The next generation of McLeans is all up to you. I have sixteen nieces and nephews. Sixteen. Why do you think there need to be more? He knew, but he didn't want to know. The burden of the family being carried down through him had always weighed heavily on him. You know as well as I do that the seventh son always has seven sons, and it's that seventh son who inherits the ranch. It's up to you to do your part to make sure it continues. She shook her head. Jack, just read the letter. If she appeals to you, send for her. He handed the letter back. She's perfect. If you want me to marry her, send for her. I don't care. With those words, he strode from the house angrily. Why did everyone feel like he needed to do everything his ancestors had done? Being the seventh son would get him off the hook in most families, but not in his. He didn't want seven sons. Maybe in ten years or so, but right now. He sighed. His mother was right. It was time for him whether he thought it was or not. It didn't matter either way, though. He was sure his mother was writing a letter to his correspondent at that very moment. Beulah set the letter aside as she finished reading the chapter on the joys of childbirth. She knew the letter was from the man she'd written to in the hopes he would immediately reject her. That's not what Wiggy wanted, of course, and as she watched, all the other young ladies who taught at the school were writing letters to the men they had found who wanted brides. 
Finally, she picked up the letter, turning it over in her hand several times. She noted a strong, feminine penmanship on the envelope, but that could be for any reason. Perhaps Mr. McLean couldn't read. It wasn't an uncommon affliction, and she wouldn't mind being married to a man who was illiterate. Then perhaps he wouldn't notice just how well-educated she was. Well, how well self-educated. She was as educated as a woman who could not afford to go to college could possibly be. She opened the letter, forcing herself to read the words written there. Dear Miss Wig, please find the attached train ticket for you to come here to Bagley, Texas, where my son will pick you up from the train station. Thank you for your willingness to marry. Sincerely, Mrs. McLean. Beulah shrugged. He hadn't even pretended to write his own letter, but if he felt as she did about marrying, that would explain the situation. A spark of hope formed in her bosom. Perhaps he didn't want to marry, he could be doing it to satisfy his mother, just as she was doing it to satisfy Wiggy. Perhaps, upon her arrival, a bargain could be made. She could continue her studies and teach at the local school, and he could pretend he wasn't married. Yes, that would do nicely. Living under the same roof, but not exactly being married. It would be a marriage of convenience and in name only. That sounded perfect. When Catalina came into the room later, she whispered her plan to her, hoping it wouldn't get back to Wiggy. The man I'm marrying doesn't seem to want me any more than I want to be married. I am hoping we can just be roommates, like you and me. And then I can go about my life, and he can go about his, and we won't have to really be married. Catalina sighed. But what about children? I know you say you don't mind not having them, but I've seen you with your students. You love them with everything inside you. How much more would you feel, for children of your own? Beulah shrugged. What do I need children of my own for? I'll be teaching there, whether Jack McLean likes it or not. He'll be nothing more than a roommate anyway. You need to be open to whatever happens when you arrive in Texas, Beulah. You can't know that he's going to agree to your plan. And you can't know that he won't. I'll do what it takes, but I plan to be content with my students. End of story. I hope it works out for you. I really do. Catalina didn't look convinced, but Beulah didn't really care. If she had to marry, she would do it her way. Who was going to stop her? On the day of her departure, Beulah found she was a great deal more nervous than she'd expected to be. She stood on the train platform with Catalina, Dorothy, and Emmeline. The three of them were showing their support, and Beulah tried to pretend their friendship didn't matter, but all three of them knew better. You're going to have a grand adventure, Catalina told her. I hope it makes you as happy as I think it will. Dorothy pressed some flowers into her hand. From my own garden. I hope they always remind you of home. Just dry them flat by putting them in the pages of one of your anatomy books, and you can always remember us. Emmeline moved forward, her eyes unfocused, as usual. She hugged Beulah close. You've been a great friend to me. I shall miss you more than I can express. Beulah kissed her friend on the cheek. Keep in touch. I'll try to find just the right remedy to help your eyes. Emmeline had never come right out and admitted she was losing her eyesight, but it was obvious to Beulah, and she'd been experimenting with different concoctions, trying to help her friend. Emily nodded slightly, obviously hating to admit that she was losing her sight, even to Beulah. I'll miss all of you. Write to me. Beulah answered the call of all aboard, and started toward the train. She couldn't believe it was time to actually leave. Days and days on a train were not her idea of a good time, but she had her books for company. As she moved to her seat, her eyes sought out her last glimpse of the girls she'd known since childhood. She would miss them. Tears popped into her eyes, but she brushed them away with the back of her hand. She wouldn't cry. She was going to be happy. There was absolutely nothing to stop her. Jack stood on the train platform, still annoyed with his mother for putting him in this situation. What had she been thinking? If he'd wanted a bride, he could have chosen from any number of boring young women at church. Didn't that tell her something? He was certain this woman would be just as boring as the rest thinking of nothing more important than the color of the dress they wore and how they should fix their hair. 
empty-headed women were the bane of modern society, and the worst part was, no one really seemed to understand that, but him. When the train pulled into the station, exactly on time as usual, he straightened his tie and looked down at the sign in his hand. His mother had insisted on making a sign for him with his future bride's name on it. They weren't to be married immediately. His mother said Saturday was soon enough, and Beatrice, or was it Beth, would want to change her clothes and have a nice bath before she'd be ready to marry. She'd also said some other things about how his bride had a right to know him before taking his name, but he'd ignored that part of things. He was tired of her, and everyone else, thinking they were allowed to run his life simply because he was the seventh son. Who cared if he didn't have seven sons of his own? Did it really matter that much? When people started to get off the train, he stood waiting. There were exactly four people who disembarked the train at this stop. Two were an older couple he'd known his entire life, and he nodded to them, tipping his hat. The other two were both young women. One seemed to be looking for someone, but the other, well, she was carrying a huge book and seemed to be reading something as she walked. She almost stumbled into someone, and that's when she marked her page and closed her book. She stood looking around her, and when her eyes landed on Jack, he felt as if he'd been punched in the gut. She nodded to him cordially and stepped toward him. I'm Beulah Wig. I presume you're Jack McLean. Jack opened his mouth to speak, but nothing came out. Finally, he just nodded. This woman was not only beautiful, but judging by the anatomy book in her hands, she wasn't empty-headed either. His mother had chosen well for him, surprisingly enough. He thought she would want the type of woman from church, and this Beulah was nothing like that at all. It's good to meet you, Mr. McLean. Are we to marry immediately? Your mother didn't tell me in her letter. He shook his head, and that's when Beulah really understood the situation. The man was mute. Why he hadn't written his own letter, she didn't know, but obviously he couldn't speak. That was all well and good with her. If he couldn't speak, he couldn't object to her plans for her future. They would get along very well indeed. Chapter 2 Beulah decided the best course of action would be to pretend that she didn't realize Jack was a mute. At least for now. So she decided to chatter as they drove, not really giving him time to respond. She'd seen other women do it, and it seemed to work for them. Of course, her chatter would be quite different from theirs. She'd talk about things that really mattered. One of the reasons I wanted to come here was so I could start a school. Do you know if there's a school in Bagley already? She asked, looking over at him so she could see if he nodded or shook his head. When he shook his head, she realized she wasn't certain if that meant he didn't know, or that there was no school. So she asked differently. Is there a school in Bagley? He shook his head again. Ah, now they were driving with horses. Beulah smiled. Good, I would love to start a school. I've been teaching biological sciences for several years back in New York. I love literature and history, but I seem to be more suited to teaching the sciences and mathematics. I tend to do well with older children as well, because I sometimes teach over the heads of small children. She sighed contentedly, suddenly thrilled with her situation. Do you live with your mother? She was the one who wrote the letter to me. At his nod, she continued. That will be nice. She can continue taking care of the house while I teach. Yes, I can see that would be the best situation. I would like to be able to start teaching on September 1st, so that gives us a month or so to get the schoolhouse built, which shouldn't be a problem if all the men in the area are willing to pitch in. My parents will be moving out of the house as soon as we're married, he said. His deep voice startled her, and she jumped. You can speak? I thought you were mute. He blinked at her a few times. Why would you think I was mute? Well, you didn't say anything. I was asking you questions at the train station, and all you did was nod and shake your head. What else was I supposed to think? She glared at him, feeling as if he'd deceived her. Well, I'm not mute. I was just a little stunned to see you carrying an anatomy textbook and actually reading it. I was a little lost for words at first because I'd expected you to be like the empty-headed women I know around here, and you're anything but. I hate to say my mother chose well for me, 
but I really believe she did. Beulah frowned at that. Does that mean you want a real marriage? He gaped at her for a moment, before turning his eyes back to the road in front of him. Why would you think I didn't want a real marriage? What other reason would I be sending for a wife? She sighed. I guess when it was your mother corresponding with me and not you, I jumped to an erroneous conclusion. Looking straight ahead, she asked him the question that was foremost on her mind. Would you mind if we waited to consummate the marriage until I was ready? Like in 1922? Jack looked over at her, wondering what was going through her mind. So far, she hadn't lied to him, and he'd know if she had, but he didn't feel like she was telling him exactly what she was thinking either. I wouldn't mind waiting for a designated period of time that we can both agree upon. I would say, let's wait until the wedding night. He couldn't believe how attractive this woman was to him. She was beautiful, but she also had a brain in her head. For some reason, smart women made his heart beat faster. His first crush had been on a governess his mother had brought in to teach his brothers and him. The wedding night? I was thinking more of a period of a few years. Years? Have you lost your mind? You want me to live under the same roof with you and sleep in the same bed with you and not consummate the marriage? Do you think I'm some sort of eunuch who can live that way? Jack shook his head, more than a little perturbed with her already. What was wrong with her that she'd even ask for such a thing? All right, maybe not years. Shall we propose a getting to know each other period of six months before we consummate the marriage? No, we shall not. I think a week is long enough, besides, we're not even getting married until Saturday. That should give you plenty of time to get to know me. I don't think you realize how negotiations work, Mr. McLean. Beulah couldn't think of him as Jack. Jack was the kind-hearted mute she'd first met at the train station. This man was nothing like the man she'd first envisioned him to be. You see, you suggested a period of a few days, and I suggested a few years. I came down to a few months, but you're still saying the same thing. He sighed, wondering what he'd thought attracted him about intelligent women anyway. Fine, a week. Five months, Beulah responded, folding her arms over her chest. The man was difficult, and she was already starting to feel a great deal of antipathy for him. Ten days. Four months. Eleven days. Jack wasn't about to give up his rights to the marriage bed. The woman was beautiful and intelligent, and she was about to be his wife. Why would he wait to bed her? She groaned aloud. Three months. And that's my final offer. Twelve days, and that's my final offer. Jack pulled into the drive that led to his house from the main road. That's not long enough to get to know you. Beulah couldn't believe the man she'd met at the train station was the ogre beside her. For just a moment, her life had seemed almost too good to be true. Now she was certain she was never going to be happy married to him. Why did you agree to be a mail-order bride if you thought you needed time to get to know the man you married? Do you have any idea how contradictory that thinking is? I didn't have a choice. She blurted the words out angrily. I wanted to stay in New York and teach biology for the rest of my life, but Madame Wig says she's dying, though I'm not sure I believe it. She's offered me a sum of money to start a school here, as long as I follow her principles of inclusion. I'm willing to follow them. But the only way to get here was to be a mail-order bride, and I have no desire to engage in sexual intercourse with you. He stared at her in shock for a moment, and then he threw his head back and laughed. A deep belly laugh. Sexual intercourse? You make it sound so clinical. He stroked a finger over her bare arm. I promise you, there will be nothing clinical about it when we consummate our marriage. She glared at him. Why won't you see reason? Why are you so stubborn? You're worse than a goat. He stopped the wagon and set the brake, jumping down to walk around and help her down. Instead of taking her hand to help her down, he caught her around the waist and made sure the front of her brushed the front of him all the way down. You're about to meet my mother. You will be sweet and docile and act like I'm the most important man in the world to you, and in exchange for my deceptive behavior, you'll wait a month to consummate our marriage? He groaned. Are you still on that? What if I refuse to wait at all? 
then I'll be forced to treat you like the randy goat you are. He chuckled, not even sure why. There's something about you that's going to make me absolutely crazy, Beulah soon to be McLean. She put her hands on her hips, wishing he'd step back, but not willing to lower herself far enough to try to push him away. You don't remember my last name, do you? You're calling me that because you don't know the full name of the woman you're supposed to marry in three days. Three days. He decided there was only one way to shut her up, and he found he was excited at the prospect. He gripped her waist with both hands and pulled her even closer toward him. They'd been barely touching, but now they were smashed up against one another. He lowered his head to hers and kissed her, but not in a way she'd ever seen anyone kiss. No, his lips were not only pressed against hers, but they were trying to get her to open her mouth. She put her hands on his chest, intending to push him away, but his chest felt so good against her fingertips. Instead, she stood on tiptoe, pressing herself closer against him, and wrapped her arms around his neck, kissing him back for all she was worth. When he finally lifted his head, they were both slightly out of breath. We're consummating on our wedding night. There's no way I'm waiting after that kiss. She stood there, her lips red and plump and moist from their kiss. Her mind, the mind that she prided herself on being her best feature, suddenly didn't work. Beulah's brain shut off right there and then. She was the one who was mute. I'm glad to see you have no argument for that. I don't care if you teach school, but you'll be in my bed every night, and when our sons start coming, you might have a hard time teaching. Sons? What about our daughters? She wasn't going to let him get the last word. He couldn't forget that there was as good of a chance for girls as there was for boys. Daughters? You'll have seven sons. Just like my mother did and my grandmother before her. My family hasn't had a daughter born of the seventh son in almost a thousand years. Don't expect to be the first. He walked to the back of the wagon and picked up her trunk, his arms shaking as he tried to hold it. What do you have in this thing? Books? Of course I have books in there. What did you think I brought with me? A different outfit for every day of the week? With those words, Beulah turned her back on him, walking toward the house. She held the door as he carried the trunk in and stood there rigidly. The man was going to be the death of her. That much was absolutely certain. A slim woman with blonde hair and green eyes stepped out of what looked to be the kitchen. Hello. You must be Beulah. I'm Mary McLean. Welcome to the family. The woman embraced Beulah, shocking her for a moment, but then she hugged her back. Never in her life had she been embraced by a total stranger. It's nice to meet you, Mrs. McLean. Your son has the manners of a goat. Her future mother-in-law laughed. Yes, he does. I'm sorry, but I have done my absolute best with him. She linked her arm through Beulah's. You need to call me Mary. Now, let's see about a tour of the house. It'll be yours as soon as you marry, so you need to know exactly what you're getting yourself into. Beulah sighed. She couldn't help but like the petite woman beside her. That sounds nice, Mary. I appreciate your offer to show me around. Where will you go if the house is to be mine? There's a property across the ranch, that's for the parents, once the youngest son marries. I knew it would one day be mine the day I married Jack's father, who does not have the manners of a goat. In fact, none of my other sons have the manners of a goat either. It's just Jack. You'll have to work on him, do you have an extra bull whip lying around? I'm afraid that might be the only thing that would work on him. Beulah shook her head. I'm very sorry. You're my future mother-in-law, and I do want to get along with you. The way to start out isn't to criticize the manners of your son. Well, sometimes his manners need to be criticized. Mary led her through the house, showing her the sitting area and the parlor, and then they went upstairs. We have five bedrooms. Then the boys will be able to pair up when all seven are here. Wait. Jack said something about seven sons as well. Why does everyone assume I'll have seven sons? I always saw myself as the mother of daughters. Mary bit her lip. I should have explained in one of my letters to you. 
In the McLean family, the seventh son always has seven sons. No more and no less. And there are never any daughters. Now you'll get granddaughters. And you'll have plenty of nephews and nieces. But there will be no daughters. And the seventh son. She trailed off, nodding her head. Well, I'll leave it at that. Beulah couldn't help but wonder what Mary had been about to say, but she saw Jack standing behind her, and she understood then he was hiding something from her. Well, that was just dandy. The man had the manners of a goat, and he was hiding things. He probably had a mistress and five children somewhere else. Well, that would only leave her to have two children, and that might be for the best. I plan to break that tradition. I want daughters. Mary sighed. Be my guest. You can believe anything you want to believe. She led Beulah to a bedroom that was mostly packed into crates. This will be the room you share with Jack. There's a small bedroom that is connected to this one, and that is what I used for the nursery. I had all seven of my sons within ten years, so there was always one in the nursery. Where do the other sons live? Most of them have property close to here. One has moved to Austin to be a lawyer there, but the other five are here in Bagley. The ranch and the house are always inherited by the seventh son, which I know is odd, but our family tends to be a bit odd. You act as if you never had a family before you became a McLean. Is that true? Mary smiled. No, not at all. I was a Johnson before I married Joseph. I lived just down the road in the town of nowhere. Jack said there's no school here in Bagley. I want to start a school. It's one of the reasons I moved here. I think that's very admirable of you. I'll see that a site is picked out for the school soon. I believe you could even start a country school here, just outside of Bagley, and then you wouldn't have to walk so far to get to the schoolhouse. You don't mind if I teach? Beulah asked. She was starting to like Mary a great deal. If only her son was more, well, more human instead of goat-like. I think it's a great idea for you to teach. You might need to get a nanny once the children start coming, but no one will complain at all if you want to educate the children in the area. Beulah smiled. Thank you. No problem. You know, I think we should donate a small piece of the property to your schoolhouse. You could teach just the McLean children and stay busy. Are there that many? Mary laughed. I have sixteen grandchildren and two more on the way. Yes, there are a great deal of children in our family and always have been. Two of the grandchildren live in Austin, though, so you won't be teaching them. I feel very strongly about inclusion. If there are Indian children or children of former slaves, they would need to be allowed to attend the school. Oh, of course they would. We would not have it any other way. I'll instruct the boys to start building the schoolhouse on Monday right after the wedding. For a moment, Beulah considered asking Mary to help her with her argument with Jack about when they should consummate the marriage, but she thought better of it. The woman was obviously all about the propagation of more and more McLean children. How would she feel about putting off those children for a few months? Probably not at all good. When they walked back down the stairs, Jack was sitting in the parlor. I was just waiting until you were finished. Mother. What room should I put Beulah in until after the wedding? Put her in the room closest to mine. You're at the far end of the hall, and I think she might need a chaperone who is close to her at night. Mother! Jack protested. You sound like you don't trust me, Mary laughed, walking over and patting her son on the cheek. I don't trust you one whit. Now take the trunk upstairs and get back to work. I'm going to spend some time with my future daughter in law. Jack sighed, but he did as he was told. He knew better than to disobey a direct order from his mother. Chapter 3 After supper that night, Jack pulled Beulah's chair out for her. Would you care to go for a walk? he asked. Beulah wondered if he would always act properly around his mother and act like a goat when she wasn't there. I need to help your mother with the dishes first. Mary shook her head. Tomorrow night is soon enough for that. You've been traveling for more than a week. Go for a walk with Jack, and you two get to know each other. Her eyes met Jack's. 
Act like you were raised by humans and not by goats, please. Jack stared at his mother in shock. Why would you think I'd act like a goat? Beulah told me you have the manners of a goat. Lovely. What a wonderful way for my future bride to meet my mother. He offered Beulah his arm. Let's walk. I'll show you around the ranch a bit. Beulah wasn't sure she cared to see the ranch or get to know Jack better, but she wasn't about to act like a fishwife in front of her future mother-in-law. She liked the woman too much to show her bad side. All right. She took Jack's arm and walked toward the front door with him, having little interest in the ranch. What I want to know is where my school will be. Your mother told me the family would donate some land for me to start a country school. Jack sighed. You do know the babies will start coming soon and you won't be able to teach any longer. Why won't I? And the babies won't come if we wait to consummate the marriage. I think five years should be long enough. Not happening. I felt you up against me, and I felt you return my kiss. You don't care any more than I do if we get to know one another better. We're having a wedding night on our wedding night, no reason for you to be difficult about it. She didn't look at him as she walked with him. This ranch is huge. It is. It's one of the largest ranches in Texas. He didn't add that they were one of the wealthiest families, because they tried to keep that low-key. We have a bunkhouse across the ranch. You won't be expected to cook for the men, because there's a cook already, but there will be times you'll come into contact with the men who work for us. Will that bother you? Why would it? she asked. Well, you don't seem to be very fond of men. Do you feel like you can protect yourself? If you're asking if I can shoot a gun, no, I can't. I've never been taught, but it's something that's always fascinated me. I've read enough about it that I'm certain I could assemble a gun with my own two hands if I was given the pieces. Do you want to teach me to shoot? Jack's mind immediately thought of holding her with his hands covering hers. He would be happy to have her pressed back against him as he taught her to shoot. Why not? It could be fun. I'd be happy to teach you. Would you like to learn tomorrow? I have a wedding in three days. Spending one of those days learning to shoot instead of preparing for the wedding would be absolute folly. Perhaps next week. Beulah liked the images of him teaching her to shoot that popped into her head, but she needed to worry about backing away from him, not moving closer. About having seven sons. Shouldn't someone have warned me that your family works that way? I only want to have daughters. I don't think that's going to happen, but you can keep wanting it all day long. He stopped at a fence and leaned over it. Most of the herd is on the other side of this fence. We have thousands of head of cattle, and we will continue to add more. I plan to make this the largest ranch in Texas by the time my seventh son is born. Why do you feel the need to have the largest ranch? Are you someone who always has to be better than the next man? Why, yes, I am. I believe that being your best is one of the most important things a man can do. Don't you? Beulah shrugged. No idea. I've never been a man. She'd rarely been around men. She'd had male students, but never having really gone anywhere but the orphanage where she'd been raised had kept blinders on her eyes where the opposite sex was concerned. Tell me about your family. You've met my parents. What is your mother like? She shrugged. I was left on the doorstep of a foundling home as an infant. I have no memories of a real family. I just know the woman who ran the home, and she was my surrogate mother. I have her last name. I didn't know you were an orphan. Does that bother you? She turned her back on him. I'm sorry if you were looking for a wife with a pedigree, but I don't have one. I'm simply a woman, nothing more, and nothing less. I couldn't care less about your family. You could have told me you were half Indian and half African, and I wouldn't care. He shrugged. My family has always been open to people of all races. We pride ourselves on hiring cowboys from any race, and there is no favor given to those who are white. Beulah looked at him and nodded. He'd just gone up a notch in her eyes. You have a good attitude about such things. I'm impressed. Thank my parents. They've taught me to be this way. 
he took her hand and walked her over toward the stables. Do you enjoy teaching? Beulah nodded. It's the only thing I've ever done. I would have been a doctor, but as an orphan, there were no funds for a women's college, so instead, I'm a teacher. I spend my spare time studying anatomy texts, though. I see no reason not to learn as much as I can about my chosen profession on my own. I'm sorry that life has been difficult for you. And he was. Jack had always had things easy, and he found that he wished she had as well. It would have been nice to know she'd chosen to move to Texas to become his bride and not been forced into it, but he knew better. I've had a good life. Unlike many orphans, I was taken into a home owned by a wonderful woman who did her best by every single orphan. I'm glad you weren't an orphan on the streets somewhere, or put on a train to be adopted by anyone who would take you. I don't think that's a good situation for children. I know a few who were pretty much forced to be servants to the families who took them in. Beulah nodded, I've heard stories like that. She wasn't sure what else to say to this man. He was about to be her husband, and all she knew about him was that he expected to have seven children and his manners were grossly lacking. What hobbies do you have? Hobbies? He shrugged. I enjoy playing card games, and I like to train horses. That's one of my favorite things, honestly. I often train horses and sell them to other ranchers. Thus making him even richer than his father had been before him. There was no reason to talk to her about money, though. He didn't want her to marry him for his wealth. That sounds like it could be both fun and lucrative. She looked toward the house and realized he'd taken her far from the main building where his parents were. She felt a shiver run down her spine. Was he trying to lure her away for nefarious reasons? I know what you're thinking, and I promise not to do anything you don't want. I did want a chance to kiss you again. I want to see if my memory is playing games with me, or if your kisses really were as potent as I remember. Potent? She'd never heard the word used when describing kisses. She'd rarely heard the word at all. Yes, potent. Your kisses made me feel as if I could fly and take on all the world at once. That's what I mean by potent. You didn't feel like that before my kiss? Because I have to say, you come across as a man who doesn't think he has any flaws or shortcomings. Isn't that true? He shrugged. Oh, I do know I'm not perfect. I don't even pretend I am. He stopped walking and turned to her, his hands going to her waist. Now, let's see if my memory is correct. For a moment, she considered pulling away from him, but she was curious herself. It was rather like a science experiment. She would allow him to kiss her to see if there was as much electricity as it seemed like there had been. She was sure she'd discover that her memory was faulty as well, but it was worth a try. She put her hands on his shoulders and raised her lips to his, closing her eyes. Jack just stood and looked at her for a moment, drinking in the beauty of the woman in front of him. She was something else, this little bride of his. She was just as beautiful, if not more so, than the empty-headed women at church, but she was so intelligent. She may be lacking some of their sweetness, but he'd always been a fan of things a little more sour than most. She was perfect for him. He lowered his lips to hers and kissed her, his arms wrapped tightly around her. Waiting just the three days till their wedding night would be all but torture, and he wasn't sure he could do it. He certainly wasn't going to allow her to dictate that they wait beyond their wedding night, though. No, she was going to be his, and he would move the wedding forward if anything. Beulah clung to him, realizing that she needed to stop with this particular experiment. What good was it to do something scientific when your mind stopped functioning as soon as it began? When he lifted his head, she pressed her cheek against his shoulder. Never had she thought she would have base needs where a man was concerned, but this man. This man was something special. Base needs or not, she wanted to hold on to him forever. What had happened to her since she'd gotten off that train? As they walked back toward the house, he had his arm wrapped around her waist, and her head was against his shoulder. Mother will be taking up all your time for the next few days, he said softly. There are last-minute preparations for the wedding, and she's obsessed with making the ceremony perfect. Wedding? she asked. I really thought we'd just go before a justice of the peace. 
I wish. No, my mother is determined that we will have a wedding with all the frills. She is planning to adjust her wedding dress to fit you. The church I've attended since I was born is in Bagley, and she has talked to the pastor about marrying us. The wedding is set for two on Saturday afternoon, and she plans to have a big reception here that evening. There will be dancing on the lawn, and she'll serve a big cake, and we'll all feast. You'll probably be conscripted into cooking most of the day tomorrow, as well as all of my brother's wives. Beulah frowned. I'm not sure I'm ready to have a huge wedding. It will only be your people and none of the people I consider my family. You have people you consider family? Well, there are three women who were like sisters to me back in the orphanage. My roommate Catalina would have been my maid of honor, if I'd been given the opportunity to have one. And Dorothy and Emmeline are the other two I consider sisters. I wish they could be here. If I'd known, I'd have told you to bring them with you. Did you even read one of my letters? she asked. I mentioned all three of them in my first letter to you. She'd written two of them, the second agreeing to come and marry him. No, I left that to my mother. He frowned. When I got your first letter, I was about to open it, but then my mother told me what it was. She's the one who put me in that awful newspaper, looking for a bride. I knew nothing about it until your letter arrived. I see. Beulah looked over at him. You were forced into this just as I was. Are you sure you don't want to wait for the wedding night? He laughed. You've got to be joking. If I'm going to be married, I'm at least going to get what I want out of it. She sighed. I had a feeling you'd say that. I just. I'm not sure I'm ready to start having children immediately. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, he responded, knowing that children would come immediately. They always did to the McLeans. But you really don't mind if I teach? She didn't want to care about how he felt about it, but she did. She'd been taught that a husband's opinion was important, even if she didn't believe that he had the right to tell her exactly what she should do and when. Jack shrugged. I don't mind. I do want you to know that our children must always come first. If for some reason you are sick during your pregnancy, I'll expect you to take care of yourself and the baby and not worry about the children you are teaching. That might be difficult for me, but I do see the merit in what you're saying. Anyone can teach the children at school, but only I can bear the child. It does make sense. I'm glad you agree. He opened the door to go inside, finding his parents in the parlor. He sat down on the settee and pulled her down beside him. She has seen the farm. And the error of her ways? His father asked, winking at her. There is no error to my ways, Beulah responded. I'm here, and I'll be the best wife I can be, but at the same time, I'll be the best teacher I can be. Easy enough, right? He smiled. It might be harder than you think but I'm glad you feel like it will be easy for you. His mother frowned at his father, who had introduced himself as Sebastian. Leave her alone, Bastian. She's an intelligent woman, who doesn't need to be teased by you. Sebastian shrugged. How will she know I accept her into the family if I don't tease her? You could tell me. That would work. Beulah yawned. I'm extremely tired. I didn't sleep well on the train. Some people claimed it rocked them to sleep, but it didn't work that way for me. It was so noisy. You should go to bed then. I'll get you a bath ready in the morning, Mary said. Do you know which room is yours? Beulah nodded. Yes, of course. You said the one that was closest to your room. I'll bid you all good night. She got to her feet, nodding to them all formally. As she walked up the stairs to her room, she thought about what a strange day it had been. She'd been in absolute euphoria when she'd thought that Jack was a mute and couldn't tell her what to do, and then she had been so disappointed by his attitude about the wedding night. But now. Now she wasn't certain she wanted to wait either. His touch made her think about parts of her body that she'd never dared think about in anything but a clinical way before. There was something awfully special about Jack and equally infuriating. Being married would definitely be the challenge of her lifetime. At least she had the school to look forward to, and Mary seemed to be all for it. Together, they would make sure she did what she needed to do by way of the school. 
she found her trunk and undressed, lying her nightgown on her bed. She wished she'd had the opportunity for a bath that day. Oh, she was certain she could have requested one, but it had been easier to just go along with what had already been planned for her. Taking the pitcher of water provided, she filled the bowl with water and gave herself a quick sponge bath, feeling cleaner than she had in many days. Back in New York, she'd been able to bathe twice a week, hopefully that could continue here, but she'd heard that Texas had water problems at times. Pulling her nightgown over her head, she slid in between the clean sheets and closed her eyes, saying a quick prayer, thanking God for her safe journey and praying that her future husband would prove to be a more reasonable man than he'd seemed so far. And then she lay in her bed awake for hours, wondering why she couldn't sleep. She was beyond exhausted. When her eyes finally closed, she could see Jack standing there, grinning at her. It was the grin that told her he'd won, and she had to be finished with the fight. Chapter 4 The next two days went by in a flurry of activity. Beulah met all of Jack's sisters-in-law as they worked together to prepare the food for the wedding. One of his brother's wives, Josie, helped her to alter the wedding dress Mary was loaning her. I think we have it. Josie said with a smile. Thank you so much for your help, Beulah told her. It was just hours before the wedding, and they finally had it right. Josie reminded her a great deal of Catalina, and she was happy to have a new friend. I'm just thrilled to see Jack finally marrying. We all thought he'd wait longer, you did? Josie nodded. He has always complained about how empty-headed the girls at church seem to be. He wanted a woman who was pretty, but also had a brain in her head. It's obvious he found exactly what he wanted in you. Beulah laughed softly. I'm not so sure. He wanted an intelligent woman, but he also seems to want a biddable woman. I'm only one of those. Josie grinned. We won't tell him just yet. Oh, I'm afraid he's known since the ride home from the train station in Bagley. I'm not one to hide who I am from anyone. It's not like he wouldn't know anyway. I hate that Jack always knows if someone is telling the smallest fib around him. It's downright creepy. What do you mean? Well, you know. He has that ability to know when anyone around him is lying. Josie shrugged. I'm not sure if I'd like it if Stan had the same ability. Beulah already knew that Jack's brother Stan was Josie's husband. I'm not following you. Josie's eyes grew wide. You don't know about the McLean curse? I don't. What on earth are you talking about? The youngest McLean's son gets control of all the family properties, which gives him the responsibility to carry on the family name. But he also gets a special power. Each generation is something different. From what I understand, the abilities can be repeated, but never by successive generations. Sebastian's ability is to be able to heal objects with his touch. So if his horse's harness is broken, he can touch it, and it will mend itself. But Jack got the ability to tell if someone is lying to him. That's impossible, Beulah said with a frown. I'm a scientist, and I know that such a thing cannot happen. Josie smiled sweetly and shrugged. I must be lying to you then. Beulah couldn't stop thinking about what Josie told her. Later as she walked down the aisle toward Jack, she wondered if what her new friend had said was true or if she was pulling her leg. Or maybe she believed it to be true, but how could it really be? Such a thing was impossible, and she hated that she was questioning her own knowledge of science. She stood beside Jack and promised to love, honor, and obey him. Even as she said obey, she knew she never would, she didn't believe in blindly doing what a man said, but she had to promise, because it was part of the vows. As soon as the wedding was over, he looked at her. You lied during the vows. Excuse me? You'll love me. You'll honor me. But you have no intention of ever obeying me, and that's fine, but you should have talked to me before the vows were exchanged. Beulah frowned at him. Do you really have the ability to tell when anyone around you is lying? I do. It's my talent as the seventh son of my generation. Each seventh son gets something. He offered her his arm, and they walked to the back of the church, thanking people for coming. Through the afternoon and evening, they feasted on the food made by the McLean women the day before, 
and there was a small group of musicians that played so they could dance on the lawn. The first dance was just Beulah and Jack, and she realized that she had never before danced with a man. Madam Wig had made sure everyone could dance, of course, but they had to partner up with other girls to learn. Now she was dancing with a man for the first time in her life, and it felt odd. Every eye was on them as he carefully spun her around the yard. Mother said that the schoolhouse would be started on Monday. Does that please you? Beulah nodded. There's nothing I want more. She looked over at the house and noticed there were several men dressed in work clothes, carrying crates out of the house. What are those men doing? They're taking mother and father's belongings to the cottage across the grounds, where they'll live from now on. They're moving today? She had hoped they'd wait a little while. She wasn't sure she was ready to live alone with Jack. Having a buffer for a while could only be a good thing. Yes. I thought you knew they'd move out as soon as we were married. Well, I knew, but I didn't know. That makes no sense. I thought as soon as we were married meant within a week or two. Not the very day of the wedding. That's crazy. It's a way to give us our privacy. They're ready for more grandchildren, and you know you're expected to give birth to seven sons for me. It's time for us to start our own family, and what better way for them to encourage it than to give us complete and utter privacy to start off our marriage. I suppose. She was nervous about being that alone with him, though. She'd expected someone to be there. Why it mattered to her, she didn't know, but. It did. Does that bother you? he asked. A little. I guess I thought they'd be there for a while longer. I felt safer. I've only known you for a few days. Maybe that's true, Jack said, but you're my wife. It's time for us to be alone together. Beulah nodded her agreement, although reluctantly. Is it all right that the mere idea makes me really nervous? He nodded. Absolutely. You have every right to be nervous. We'll both have a new experience tonight, but I hope it's one we'll both enjoy. She didn't meet his eyes at that. She knew physically what to expect, but she didn't know how it would affect her emotionally. How could she? The whole thing was a bit overwhelming. She'd survive, though. And she'd get her own school, where she could teach children and shape minds from it. She was sure the move was worth it, and the marriage was worth it. Oh, if only she could believe that. As the night wore on, the guests slowly went their own ways. Mary had hired servants to clean up the mess when the party was over, and they were all in the house, doing their job. Beulah looked at her new husband and needed a little more time before they would go inside and be together. Would you like to sit on the porch swing for a little while? He shrugged. Not particularly, but if it will make you feel better, I'll do it. She smiled. It will make me feel better. Jack offered his arm. Then by all means, let's sit. He wanted her to be less nervous about the whole situation, but he knew it was an impossibility he was asking of her. She was not someone who went into new experiences lightly, and that was obvious. She liked things to be familiar around her, and she'd just moved across the country to marry a stranger. No wonder she was nervous. As soon as they sat, Beulah asked a question that had been on her mind all day. Josie told me that there's a McLean curse. He smiled. Some people call it that. My brothers in particular, but I don't feel cursed, I feel blessed. He thought about the best way to explain it. As far back as our family can be traced, there have been seven sons born to the seventh son. And each seventh son has had a special power. My power is the ability to know when someone lies. No one wants me on a jury, because I automatically know if I should believe what's being said. That would make things difficult. It does. If one of my brothers suspects that his child is lying about something, the child is brought to me, and I know immediately if they are speaking lies or truth. He leaned his head on the back of the swing. I know it's not something that's exactly normal, but it's always been in my life, so I don't see it as anything unusual, if that makes sense. I'm happy to have the power even though my brothers think of it as a curse. Beulah wasn't sure how she'd feel about a power like that. What are some other powers? I've heard that some of my family has had the power to heal, 
the power to speak to animals, and the power to detect when danger is around. The powers do seem to repeat themselves, but none are two generations in a row. I have to wonder what power our youngest son will have. Wait, I hadn't considered that we would have a child with one of these mysterious powers. That is a bit frightening. Not at all. He grinned at her. Just think. He'll be special, whoever and whatever he is. Special or cursed. I guess I can see both sides of that coin. She stared off into space a little longer. I guess if you've grown up knowing all these things, and how your family would be different, it would seem normal. But from where I'm sitting, it's a bit overwhelming. It would be. Jack reached over and took her hand in his, gripping it tightly. I promise that I won't let life overwhelm you too much. I'm in this with you, and we will raise the children together. You won't be on your own. She frowned at him. You plan to take an active role in child rearing? Beulah had never heard of such a thing. Every man she'd heard of had let his wife do all the work with child rearing while he had the fun of begetting the children. It had seemed like an unfair way to do things, but she had known it was the way of the world. Yes, I do. That's how it is in my family. I will not only run the ranch, but I will be very active in helping out with our boys. Together, we'll manage. I promise. But you didn't want to marry. There it was. That was the truth as she knew it. He hadn't wanted a wife, and his mother had sent off for her. How did he feel now? I didn't want a wife until I saw you get off that train, your eyes glued to the anatomy book in your hands. That's when I knew that I had to have a wife. I had to have you from that instant on. Really? Why was my anatomy book so important to you? Because I needed an intelligent wife, someone who was concerned more than with the latest fashions and hairstyles. You are that someone. You are the woman I want for all time. I know I didn't ask for you. I know you were the luck of the draw. But God sent me who I needed. That's another thing about being the seventh son of a seventh son. Luck. We're incredibly lucky people. Beulah shook her head. I feel like I'm in over my head, and we're barely married. How am I going to feel in a month or two? Probably pregnant. He grinned at her. Another thing about my family is we tend to have babies quickly. Every generation that I've ever heard of has had seven babies within ten years of marrying. I hope you're ready for the onslaught of children. If I said I wasn't, would you let me wait for the wedding night? He frowned at her. We've been over that. I thought we'd both decided it was for the best we go through with it. You decided. I'd like a little time, because I don't want to be pregnant at the beginning of the school year. I think we need to have our wedding night on our wedding night. Beulah sighed and nodded. I guess I have no choice then, do I? That's why I never wanted to marry. I liked having all of my choices as my own. Well, you'll still be able to make most of your own choices. This one is out of your hands, though. You know as well as I do that the passion between us is pretty spectacular. You don't need to be nervous about it or worry. Just enjoy. She closed her eyes at that. I'm not sure that's possible, but I'll try. It's possible. I promise you that. As the last of the servants hired for the night left the house, he took her hand and led her inside. I'll give you twenty minutes to get ready for bed, he said softly. But after that, I'm coming in. She gulped and nodded, heading upstairs. As nervous as she was, she knew he was right. She'd worry about it every day until they consummated, so for her it was best to just get it over with. She washed up with the pitcher and bowl and put on her nightgown. A married woman now, her choices were no longer her own. Not all of them. Monday morning, Beulah was at the site for the new school, watching as they broke ground. All six of the McLean brothers who still lived in Bagley were there to help with the work. She and her mother-in-law were going to make sandwiches for their lunches, but she wanted to oversee the building, at least this first day. Once she was satisfied they were clearing a large enough area for the school she wanted, and they knew she wanted a window facing east next to the teacher's desk, she went back to the house to start on making sandwiches. She had no idea how many to make for six working men, 
but Mary was there beside her. You bake the bread, and I'll start frying ham, Mary told her. We'll want at least four loaves. Four loaves of bread to feed six men? Beulah asked, stunned at the sheer amount of food. And two women. But those men will be working hard today. That kind of physical labor burns off a lot of energy, and the men will need to eat a lot to make up for it. Mary stood in front of the stove with ham steaks, and she fried steak after steak. Two ham steaks per man will make four sandwiches apiece. That should fill them up. We'll want to take them water around ten for a mid-morning break as well. They'll get the schoolhouse built in a couple of weeks, but we have to keep them fed and watered throughout the process. I had no idea it would take this much effort to keep them fed. I guess I thought they'd eat a normal amount. Oh, this is a normal amount for my boys, Mary said. But they all work jobs where they put in hard hours. So they need a lot of food to make up for it. You'll be cooking this way for years and years as you have your own sons and they start working. I'm not sure I'm up to cooking this much. I'll be teaching as well. Mary frowned. You may need to hire a housekeeper to do some of the cooking and housework while you teach. I'm not sure you can keep up with both. Beulah frowned. Is that all right? I've always thought it would be my job to do everything once I married. Well, if you're teaching, I think it's absolutely permissible. I'll help you find someone. Trust me, Jack doesn't want you wearing yourself out by working all the time. He wants you to have energy for him. Beulah blushed, thinking about what her husband would want her to do with her energy. Instead of saying something, she simply kneaded the dough in front of her. She couldn't help but wonder if her friends had found their new husbands yet, or if they were still back in New York. Each of them had promised to send her a letter once they were settled. She didn't feel like she could send them anything at all yet, but she'd start writing later that day. She wanted to keep them all up to date on her school and everything she was doing. When they took the men their lunches, Beulah couldn't help but blush under Jack's knowing look. He pulled her to him and kissed her softly. She was embarrassed, but it seemed like no one even noticed them. Maybe it was normal for the McLean family to kiss in front of one another. I'm going to go get another bucket of water, Beulah said softly. I'm sure you're all very thirsty after working so hard. We'd all appreciate that, Jack said with a smile. What a good, dutiful wife you are. She laughed. As long as you're building the schoolhouse, I am. Don't be so sure about my actions once you're done, though. Jack had a smile on his face as he watched her hurry back to the well for more water. She was exactly what he needed in a wife, and he thanked God for sending her to him. Chapter 5 By the time the schoolhouse was built and it was time for classes to start, Jack and Beulah had settled into a routine. He worked all day while she did her best to keep up with cooking, cleaning, and her studies. They spent the evenings together, and they got along very well. Beulah was afraid that would change once school started, because she would have so many more demands on her time, but for now, it was nice. A week before school started, Beulah and Mary interviewed different women for the position of housekeeper. After long discussions, they decided that Beulah wouldn't be able to keep up with the housework as well as the demands of her job as teacher. The third woman they interviewed, a widow named Hazel Buchanan, seemed like the perfect fit. She would move into a small cabin that was vacant outside the house so she would be close at hand. Beulah was excited at the prospect of having the help, whether she had children yet or not. Mrs. Buchanan seemed as excited as she was. I won't let you down, Mrs. McLean. Beulah had yet to get used to the name being used in regard to her. At first, she smiled at her mother-in-law waiting for a response from her, but she realized after a moment, Mrs. Buchanan was talking to her. I'm sure you won't. I appreciate the help. Together, the three of them put together a month of menus, so Mrs. Buchanan could just follow what was on her chart for meals and Beulah could do what she needed to do. It was a huge relief not to have to worry about household chores, so she could simply concentrate on her teaching. As much as Beulah wanted to start a school, she was nervous. She had only ever taught biology, and now she would be teaching every subject for every age level. How would she manage to do all of that and not feel behind all the time? The night before the first day of school, Beulah sat on the porch swing with Jack, 
curled into his side with her head on his shoulder. She was amazed as always about how easy it was to feel comfortable touching him and being touched by him. Having a man in her life who was allowed to touch her at all was odd. And this man was someone she readily went to. I'm nervous about school tomorrow, she told him softly, nervous about teaching? You? You've made it clear since the day you arrived that your whole goal was to teach. Jack stroked her arm as he spoke, feeling badly for her. This was her goal, and now she was nervous? Didn't seem like her at all. Well, I'm used to teaching one subject, and every class learns the same thing from me. This time I'll be teaching all subjects for a group of children. I was only teaching 14 and 15 year olds, and now I'll teach every age group. I'll teach reading and basic math, not just how the human body works. I can see how that would make you nervous, but Beulah, you're a born teacher. How can you doubt that you have the ability to do it all? Oh, I know I have the ability. I wonder if I will have the patience to manage a classroom of so many students. Teaching someone to read and basic arithmetic is so different than anything I've ever done. She snuggled closer to him, needing his touch for assurance. He pressed a kiss to the top of her head. You'll get through it, and you'll excel as you always do. I know some of your evenings will need to be spent grading papers, but I believe in you. You've been a good husband to me. This first month of our marriage has been almost idyllic. I certainly hope we can both continue that with me working. Are you worried we won't be able to? She shrugged. I become a totally different person when I teach. I'm much more rigid with my schedule and what I'm doing. It might be difficult for you to be around me. I don't see why that would be hard. With Mrs. Buchanan doing most of the housework, it should be simple. I'll still get my suppers on time. What else would I have to complain about? He really didn't see what her worry was. She'd been a docile, loving wife since the day they married. Why would that change simply because she was working? She grinned at him, realizing he truly didn't understand. In a few days he would, and then they'd discuss this all again. Truly, he wouldn't know her when she started being the strong teacher and disciplinarian that would be required of her as a teacher. Well, for now, I think I should be going to bed early. I'll start the day with my own studies, and I need to be there before my students start arriving. I'll be getting up at four instead of six, four? He gaped at her for a moment before he laughed. Oh, I see. You're joking with me. She shook her head. I'm really not. I'll still be getting your breakfast in the mornings, because Mrs. Buchanan won't start her work until eight. Which means that I'll need to study before breakfast. An hour and a half of studying should be enough, but then I'll get ready and fix breakfast. I'll want to be walking toward the schoolhouse by 7.30 at the latest. I can't even imagine how difficult things would be if I got up as late as five. She didn't add that she was grumpy if she didn't get at least four hours of sleep sleep. She thought some surprises were better left for him to find out on his own. And that surprise was one that would knock him on his backside. Beulah sat up and kissed his cheek. I'm heading to bed. Tomorrow is going to be a long day. He stood up as well. You're not going to bed without me. She smiled, taking his hand. I was hoping you'd say that. After finishing the breakfast dishes the next morning, Beulah gathered her things and walked to the school. She was thankful they'd decided to put the school on McLean property because it made the walk much shorter for her. She was already going to be stretched thin as it was. When she reached the school, she carefully put her things on the teacher's desk and walked to the brand new chalkboard. It was so clean it was almost too hard for her to write on, but write on it she must. By the end of the day, it would never look the same, though she would do all she could to keep it looking as clean as it did at that moment. Carefully she wrote the date and Mrs. McLean. She knew most of the children from going to church every Sunday, but she was told there would be a few she'd never seen before. The roster she'd been given held 18 names. She'd never had more than five or six students in a class, because she was teaching upper-level sciences. This was going to be so much more than anything she'd ever dreamed of. Once her name was on the board, she dusted the chalk dust off her fingers and took the broom from the corner of the schoolroom. There was a bit of sawdust still there on the floor, 
and she wanted the school to look perfect when the children arrived. Most of her pupils had never stepped foot in a schoolroom, so it would be a new experience for all of them, and one she wanted to be just perfect. She would instill a lifelong love of learning in her pupils. Once she had finished sweeping, she sat down and looked at her reader, wondering how many of the children would come to her with the ability to read. Not that it mattered, because she would teach each of them from wherever they started, no longer would she only have the students who were interested in learning about the sciences. Instead, she would have every student, whether they were interested in learning or not. By 8.30, she could hear the children out on the playground. She glanced out the window and saw that they'd lined their lunch pails neatly in a row. She smiled, knowing their mothers must have coached them. Then she began to wonder how many of their mothers had gone to school. She stood up and sighed. She was about to learn everything there was to know about all the children and their educations, or lack thereof. Why was she wasting her time worrying about it now? At precisely nine, she rang the school bell and stood aside as her pupils filed into the classroom. One little girl with blonde braids smiled at her nervously, and Beulah smiled back. Another student whispered, Good morning, Aunt Beulah. She just wished she could remember which of Jack's brothers that little girl belonged to. Not that it mattered. She'd figure them all out, within the week. Younger students in the front please, Beulah instructed, her voice patient and kind. She knew, because she'd been practicing her patient and kind voice for weeks. As soon as everyone was seated, Beulah pulled out a small chart she'd made with a drawing of the classroom. She sat behind her desk, with the chart in front of her and her roster of students. She called them all by name, in alphabetical order, of course. She started with Jonathan Abrams and ended with Josiah Went. As each pupil responded to her roll call, she jotted their name down in the box for their seat. When she was finished, she stood up, prepared to give them the rules of her classroom. I'm Mrs. McLean, and I'll be your teacher. I would like to start out by explaining a few small rules and getting to know all of you better. She sat on the edge of her desk, a smile on her face as she explained how everything would be. I will spend the morning ascertaining exactly where you are in your studies. Have any of you attended a school before? Only three hands went up, and Beulah nodded, making a mark next to each of the children's names that they had attended school. How many of you have been taught to read? Four more hands went up. Beulah had her work cut out for her. How many of you can recite the alphabet and know what your letters look like? She progressed through her series of questions that would help her understand what each child knew. At precisely 10.30, she finished making notes for that time. You may be excused for a 15-minute recess. Please be certain to play nicely with one another, and if anyone needs something, come to me, and I will answer your questions. As they filed out, she sat down at her desk and buried her face in her hands. She had exactly eleven students who didn't know how to read. Most of them could count to ten. There was one older girl, who must have been at least fifteen, who was unable to read. Her work was cut out for her, but now that she knew where the students were in their studies, she was able to make her lesson plans and get started. That first day, there was little mischief in the classroom. One boy had to be sent to stand in the corner when he pulled the braid of one of the little girls, but mischief like that was to be expected. Beulah wasn't upset by it one whit. By the end of the day, she had a fairly good idea which students were going to be her fast learners and which students were going to need some more help with their studies. Several of the mothers were there to pick up their younger children at the close of school, and Beulah smiled at them and answered any questions. One mother in particular seemed like she was destined to be a thorn in Beulah's side. Josiah is brilliant. Can you give him more complicated schoolwork than the others, so he can reach his potential? Beulah smiled sweetly, trying to find the best way to phrase her statement. Josiah is thirteen and can't read or count to ten yet, Mrs. Went. I will be working with him the same as the others, and if some day he seems advanced, I will be sure to give him more difficult schoolwork to help him be the best he can possibly be. Mrs. Went frowned. He can count to ten. He can? I would love to see a demonstration then. Beulah had spent time just teaching counting that day to the lowest group of learners, which Josiah was definitely a part of. He could have learned that day, but Beulah had a feeling he hadn't. 
He hadn't seemed to notice or care that he was in a schoolhouse or supposed to be learning. Josiah. Mrs. Went called. She gave Beulah a scathing look. I don't know why he's not performing his best for you, Mrs. McLean. Perhaps you're not the teacher I've heard you are. Perhaps, Beulah said, carefully keeping her smile in place. When Josiah joined them, he had his finger up his nose and carefully wiped his findings on his shirt. Yes, Ma? Would you please count to ten for Mrs. McLean? Josiah's eyes widened, and he looked like a squirrel cornered by a wolf. One, two, three, six, seven, eight, ten. Very good, Josiah, Mrs. Went said, a proud look on her face. Josiah, you missed four, five, and nine again. I would like you to practice those numbers when you get home. Remember how you copied them from the blackboard earlier? Beulah had never taught a child who seemed quite as slow-witted as Josiah, but she was determined she could teach him from wherever he was starting. Progress was progress after all. Mrs. Went narrowed her eyes at Beulah. How dare you tell my son he's wrong? Part of learning is being corrected, Mrs. Went. I will do my best to always correct with a smile and a fair attitude, but I cannot tell your child he's right about something when he's very obviously wrong. Well, I never. Mrs. Went took Josiah by the arm and led him away from the schoolyard. Maybe you should have then, Beulah mumbled under her breath. Thankfully Josiah was the last child to leave that day, so she returned to the classroom and swept the floor, wiping off the chalkboard. She would assign two boys to clap the erasers during the lunch hour the following day. As she gathered up her books to carry them home, she was absolutely exhausted. She felt as if she'd been through the ringer, but the day had been a good one. There was little mischief, if only the students were anywhere near where they should have been academically. There was only one pupil, Margaret, who was anywhere close to where she should be, and she was about a year behind. Beulah took that as a win. Margaret was sweet and very helpful to the other children, and she told Beulah that her mother had been teaching her at home whenever there was time. She was twelve, and Beulah could tell she would be an asset to the school. She was one of Jack's nieces, but Beulah had no idea which one. On her walk home, Beulah wished it was cooler. She missed the cooler New York summer and wished she had a way to spend a little time in an ice house. Knowing there would be little or no snow that winter didn't help. She'd always been one to look forward to autumn and winter for the cooler temperatures. When she got home, she walked into the kitchen and found Mrs. Buchanan there, cooking supper. That smells wonderful, Beulah said with a smile. I had no idea how very hungry I was until I walked into the house. Mrs. Buchanan smiled at her. How was your first day of school? Tiring, Beulah said honestly. I have my work cut out for me. So many of the children have never been to school before that it's hard to even know where to start. I guess the beginning is my only answer. I could have told you they wouldn't have much book learning, but I bet the boys are good with farm chores, and the girls can cook and clean with the best of them. I'm certain you're right, Mrs. Buchanan. I would like them to learn their lessons as well, though, so they can grow to become well-rounded adults. So much depends on their ability to learn. Why? What if one of the boys wants to be a doctor, but because he doesn't start learning until he's ten, he spends the rest of his life behind? I have a feeling that none of those boys are going to want to grow up to be doctors. They'll all want to be farmers and ranchers like their fathers. Mrs. Buchanan cut off a piece of bread from a loaf that had just come out of the oven and buttered it. She put it on a plate and poured a glass of milk. Teachers have to keep their strength up, too. Beulah sat down and took a big bite of the bread, chewing it slowly. Thank you, I needed that more than I realized. I'll make sure there's always a little something for you to eat when you get home from school. You look very tired. I feel tired. I don't think I've ever been this tired. Chapter 6 When Jack got home from work that afternoon, he found Beulah at the dining room table, meticulously writing something in a notebook. What's so fascinating, he asked, leaning down to kiss the top of her head. I'm trying to find the best lesson plans for the students. Do you realize that less than half of them can read? Some of them can't even count to ten. She shook her head. I'm in over my head, 
and today was the first day of school. She hadn't realized quite how overwhelmed she felt until he was standing there in front of her. He sat down and took her hand in his. Is it really that bad? Only if I want the children to be where they need to be. She rubbed the back of her neck, feeling a tear pop into her eye. Never have I been so tired after the first day of school. I just wanted to crawl under my desk and hide from all of them today. And you didn't? I think that could have been a fun game. Find the teacher. I can just see the parents' faces when they found out what you played with their precious darlings. She smiled at that. It could have been fun. I could have made them read words as they approached me, and they would have had to take a step back if they got them wrong. Yes. You should try that tomorrow. She laughed softly. I'm not so sure about that. Mrs. Wendt already thinks I'm a terrible teacher because I told her that her precious Josiah doesn't know how to count to ten. When she called him over to prove that he can, he missed three numbers, and then she was angry with me for not telling him he did well instead of correcting him. How am I supposed to teach if I'm not allowed to tell the children when they're doing something incorrectly? Don't worry about Mrs. Wendt. She couldn't spell cat if you spotted her the C and the A. And Josiah is her only child, and she believes he can do no wrong and is perfect in every way. He was caught stealing something from the mercantile, and she yelled at the shop owner for putting the candy where he could reach it. Nothing could ever be Josiah's fault. Beulah shook her head. Well at least now I know what I'm up against. And what are you up against? Jack asked, a half-grin on his face. Utter idiocy where Mrs. Wendt is concerned, obviously. Beulah looked down at the notes she'd written. I have another hour or two worth of work to do, but it can wait until after supper. I know Mrs. Buchanan has it ready if you're hungry. He nodded. I really am. Are you going to spend all evening every night working on schoolwork? I hope not. Part of the reason I'm getting up so early is so that I can get as much done as possible. Hopefully it will be enough. She hid a yawn behind her hand. I'll move my books off the table if you want to tell Mrs. Buchanan we're ready for supper. Why don't we just eat at the other end of the table so you don't have to clear your books away and bring them back? Jack hated to see her working so hard, but hopefully it really would only be the first few days of school that it would be this difficult. I have some paperwork I can do this evening, and we can just sit here and work together. He couldn't believe how much he liked the idea of sitting in peaceful silence with her, both of them working on something. I'd like that. She smiled at him, getting to her feet and stretching to one side, trying to get the kinks out of her back. I'll tell Mrs. Buchanan we're ready for supper while you wash up. As soon as supper was over, she buried her face in her book again, and Jack watched, wishing she had just a bit more time for him. He did understand, though. From the day she'd arrived, she'd made it very clear to him that teaching had to be her top priority. He went to get his ledger sheets and sat down, working hard to pay attention to his expenses and payments. Most ranchers he knew hired someone to take care of the paperwork, but he truly enjoyed doing it. Perhaps it would give him something to do on the long winter nights while his wife was otherwise occupied. Beulah's goal at school that second day was to divide the children into their classes and give them their first assignments. There were classes with 14-year-olds and 7-year-olds. It was going to be a mixed-up mess of students for a while as the younger students learned as quickly as the older ones. Her afternoon was devoted to teaching her youngest class how to recite the alphabet and recognize each letter. She knew she wanted them all to be able to at least write their names by the end of the week. Perhaps she was aiming too high, but she liked to say that it was best to shoot for the stars, lest you would not reach the moon otherwise. Again, Mrs. Wendt was waiting for Josiah at the end of the day, but this time she didn't speak to Beulah. Instead, she put her arm around her son's shoulders and turned her nose up at the teacher. Beulah was more than content with that treatment, because she really didn't care what Mrs. Wendt thought of her. She wanted to teach the students, and if their parents didn't care for her, it wouldn't hurt her one iota. Her walk home that day was just as hot, but her thoughts were in different places. Already some of her lower students had learned to write their names. Some would learn faster than others, and she would make sure they were all where they needed to be as soon as they could be. 
She went straight to the kitchen when she got home, and true to her word, Mrs. Buchanan had a plate of bread and cheese made up for her. Will that work for your snack, dear? This is perfect, thank you so much. Beulah took the snack into the dining room table and set up her work for the night again. Now that she had a better idea of where the children were and what they needed to learn, she felt like her preparations should go faster. In a week or two, she may be able to get them all done in the morning before school or during recess. She hoped so anyway. When Jack got home that evening, he saw her working and didn't bother to stop to talk. They had their supper, and then she sat with her books open in front of her. He chose a book of his own to read and sat near her. He was looking forward to Saturday, when she wouldn't be working all day. By the end of September, Beulah was exhausted. She was so worn out, she managed to get sick, and she climbed from her bed early on the first Saturday of October and hurried from the room, determined not to lose what little was in her stomach in front of her husband. Mrs. Buchanan took one look at her and shook her head. I don't know how much longer you're going to be able to keep teaching in your condition, Mrs. McLean. Beulah frowned at the housekeeper. My condition? Surely you realize you're expecting. You have all the signs. Beulah thought back to the last day of her cycle, and she realized Mrs. Buchanan was right. She hadn't had a cycle since she first got to Texas, and she was always regular. She sat down heavily in a chair, burying her face in her hands. How was she going to be able to work with as sick to her stomach as she was? The two women sat and talked for a while, deciding that Beulah would keep some crackers at her bedside. If she ate one as soon as she woke, she might be able to stave off the morning sickness. When Jack came down the stairs an hour later, his hair still ruffled from sleep, he looked at Beulah, a frown on his face. You look too pale. What's wrong? For a moment, just a split second, she considered telling him that she was fine, but she knew he'd know better. The man made her crazy. Not even a little white lie could get past him. I think I'm expecting, she said softly. Jack stared at her with surprise for a moment, and then his face split into a grin. Really? Already? He walked to her and pulled her to his feet and into his arms. I can't wait. She sighed. I'm sure. He pulled away, looking into her face. Are you not happy about the baby? I am. I think. I mean, I want children, but I would have preferred to be settled in school and know what I was doing first. It would have been nice if it would have taken me a year or two to get pregnant. He sat down at the table, feeling unreasonably rejected. I thought I told you that babies come fast for the McLeans. She shrugged. You did. But you also told me that I was only going to have sons, and I'm holding out hope for a daughter as well. She glanced over her shoulder as Mrs. Buchanan disappeared into the kitchen. Well, you can hope all you want, but you'll have only sons and seven of them. That's how my family works. I suppose. She sat down at the table next to him, sighing heavily. I do want babies. I just. I hoped for a little while longer. I wanted time to settle. Is that so hard to understand? Why he felt like she was rejecting him and not the child she carried, he didn't know. Well, you don't exactly have that choice. You're expecting now. When are you going to stop working? Stop working? I should be able to finish out the school year, or at least teach until April. Why would I stop now? I just got Josiah Went to write his name. She'd never thought the child would be able to do it, and now his mother was gloating. I told you the boy was a genius, Mrs. Went had told her. Beulah didn't bother to tell the woman that her son was the very last in the class to be able to write his name and that even the seven-year-olds were writing theirs before Josiah. She knew the woman would only get angry with her. It's about time. Jack shook his head. I don't want to have to fight about this. If you want to keep teaching until the baby is born, then that's just fine. She frowned. What about next school year? We talked when I first arrived in Texas about getting a nanny for the days I was teaching. You'd let a stranger raise your sons instead of seeing to that task yourself? We don't need you to make money, so you should stay home and raise my boys. 
I am sorry you feel that way, but I was very clear in the letters I wrote and after my arrival that I would be teaching school, not being a full-time mother. I don't expect you to understand my feelings on the matter, but I don't believe I can give up all my dreams and aspirations, simply because I'm going to bear a child. You're serious? You really don't think you need to stop teaching? I'm very serious. He frowned at her. I'm not going to fight you on this, but I do think you're wrong. Our children should come first. With those words, he stalked from the room, heading out to the stable. He had planned to take the day to spend with her, so no one was expecting him. He saddled his horse and went for a ride, inexplicably angry with the stubborn woman he'd married. Why couldn't she be the pliant woman he'd always dreamed of? Beautiful, intelligent, and easy to manage. Was he asking for too much? Beulah put her face in her hands and sobbed. She'd never been emotional, but there was something about him storming out the way he did that really got to her. She cried and cried. When she finally lifted her head and dried her tears, Mrs. Buchanan brought her a cup of hot tea and some cookies she'd made the day before. He's only ever known one way of life, and that involved his mother being home with him every day. You are asking things of him that he never imagined were possible. Beulah shrugged. I've never known the kind of life he has. I was raised in an orphanage, and though the food was plentiful and there was love, it could never be the same as growing up in a loving home with your own parents. I wish he could understand that I'm different from him and I will react differently to things. Mrs. Buchanan nodded, but she knew it was time to call in the big guns. The couple she was working for had hit a wall, and it was time Mary McLean came and talked to her daughter-in-law. I'm stepping out for a short while. I'll be back to see to the rest of my chores. After she was gone, Beulah sat quietly, wondering how she was going to handle Jack's anger. He had argued with her a bit before they married, but never had he really left to do anything consumed with anger as he just had been. Why couldn't she have married a man who was reasonable and understood logic? Beulah went upstairs and brought down her school books. She'd promised not to work that day, but what did it matter when he was gone anyway? She'd get ahead on her planning and paper grading, and hopefully she would have more time to spend with the stubborn idiot as soon as he was done sulking. It was much later when Mary McLean came into the house, sitting at the table with Beulah. Do you want to tell me what's wrong? Beulah shrugged. I can't. He's your son, and you'll always take his side. He is my son, but don't you think that means I know his faults better than anyone? You became my daughter the moment you married him, and as my daughter, I want you to tell me when you're upset. What happened? Before she could think better of it, Beulah poured out the whole story. I made it clear that I was coming here to start a school in my letters, and I even started talking about a school on my first day here. Why is he so surprised now to find out that I'm devoted to the school? Mary frowned. I didn't share your letters with him. You see, I put the ad in the paper for him to get a mail-order bride, and then when your letter came, I gave it to him, but he tossed it back at me and told me to do what I would. So I did, and you're here. He had no idea you were planning to start a school until the day you stepped off the train. But I also got the impression he didn't care one whit about me until I got off the train. Am I wrong? Jack has always known exactly what he was looking for in a bride. He wanted a woman who was pretty, intelligent, and would do what he said. He got two out of three of those things with you, and I've told him over and over to count himself lucky to get that. Beulah sighed, shaking her head. Why would he think he'd find a woman who was both intelligent and biddable? Doesn't he understand that a woman who has the ability to think for herself is going to be less likely to do whatever a man tells her to do blindly? You would think he'd know that, but apparently my son is a special kind of stupid, along with having the manners of a goat. Beulah bit back a giggle. His manners have been much better since we've married. I never should have said that to you. Oh, trust me, you made my day when you said that. It told me you were exactly what I thought you'd be intelligent and not willing to put up with any of his nonsense. And that's exactly who you are. You please me, my daughter. Beulah looked at her mother-in-law, and the tears started streaming again. I don't know what I ever did to deserve someone like you in my life. I suppose putting up with Jack's nonsense makes it so I deserve some sort of reward, though. Mary laughed. 
You are a very special lady, and you will make a wonderful mother to my grandsons. And now that you're expecting the first of them, we have to start thinking about how you will decorate the nursery. I need to start sewing a quilt for him. Decorate the nursery? You don't want to leave that up to me. I'm likely to put up pictures of human anatomy so I can show him what he needs to learn to become a doctor. Mary frowned. Perhaps some barnyard animals would be better for a nursery? Mary took a sheet of paper from the pile in front of Beulah and reached for the younger woman's pencil, perhaps like this? She quickly sketched a mare along with a foal. The foal's nose was brushing up against his mother's. That's beautiful. I didn't know you could draw like that. Mary smiled. I have hidden talents. How about you let me paint a mural on the wall of the nursery, and you just keep up your studying? I would be forever in your debt. Thank you for coming over to talk to me, Mary. I needed that. That's what mothers are for. Chapter 7 When Jack came in late that afternoon, he was dripping wet from a sudden rainstorm. He'd ridden all the way to nowhere and spent thirty minutes talking to an odd man who made his home in the woods. He'd never met him before, but the man was a legend in that area. His name was Cletus, and that's all anyone really knew about him. He walked into the house, dripping water everywhere he went. He looked at his wife, sitting so calmly at the table, working on her lesson plans. At least that's what he had to assume she was doing. She was sitting with school books spread around her and a piece of paper and a pencil at her side. Please don't drip everywhere, was all she said to him. For a moment, he thought about stomping off his feet to leave as much of a puddle as he could, but he knew it would be Mrs. Buchanan who would be left to deal with the mess, not the woman he was still angry with. I'll do my best. She glanced at him quickly, before looking down again. You should get a hot bath. You don't want to catch your death. He looked at her for a moment as if trying to ascertain if she would even care about his untimely demise, but he thought better of saying something. I will. He went up the stairs and quickly removed his soggy clothing, leaving them in a corner of the bedroom to be dealt with by someone who was not him. Thirty minutes later, he was back downstairs, clean and dry. He sat at the table, calmly looking at her. Are you still angry with me? She shrugged. I don't think angry is the right word for what I'm feeling. Hurt is better. Or maybe annoyed, but angry really isn't it. Well, I'm still angry, if you care. I do care. I don't want you to be angry with me, but I haven't gone back on my word in any way. I'm here doing exactly what I said I would do. After her talk with his mother, she'd sent a long letter to Wiggy back in New York wanting to get advice on exactly what to do from the other woman. Wiggy always knew what to do. I just want you to care a little bit more about the future of my family. That baby you're carrying means everything to me, and it seems to mean less than nothing to you. That's not true. Beulah shook her head. The baby is very important to me, because it's a part of you. But that doesn't mean that I think I should alter the entire course of my life and change all my plans that I have simply because I am carrying him. I will be the best mother I can be, and I don't want you to think otherwise, but the truth is, I've never been a mother, and not only have I never been a mother, I've never even had a mother. How am I supposed to know the correct way to act now that I'm carrying a child inside me? She raised her hands, palm up, as if questioning him. I never even dreamed I'd have a child. He frowned at that. I guess I never really thought about you never having a mother. You should spend more time with mine. She'll be able to teach you all the right ways to do things. She frowned at him. You know there are multiple right ways to be a parent, don't you? Just because your mother did it one way doesn't mean that any other way is incorrect. I don't know about that. My mother was perfect in everything she did, as far as I can tell. What about your father? Was he perfect as well? Sure. If you had parents, I'm sure you would think what they did was perfect as well. I was left on the steps of a foundling home, in a basket, when I was a few days old. Someone left me there, and I have to assume it was a parent. How could I possibly think their actions were perfect? Are we ever going to be able to see eye to eye on these things? I know our pasts are different, but you'd think that we'd at least understand one another. 
Why don't we? Beulah leaned back against her chair. I really don't know. I've read book after book on the proper way to deal with children, but they were always from a teacher's standpoint and not a parent's. Maybe I should find some books on how to parent. That seems to be my way of learning everything. Maybe you should just spend some time with the parents of some well-behaved children. My niece Alice is in your class. Have you thought maybe you could spend some time with my brother Joshua and his wife, Gertie? I suppose I could. I barely know them, though. Jack warmed up to the idea when she didn't refuse to listen to him immediately. I'll invite them for supper tomorrow night. You can get to know them and watch how they are with their children. Does that sound good? Beulah knew it wouldn't matter if it sounded good to her or not. It was what he'd decided was the best course of action, and she didn't have any strenuous objections. She'd go along with his plan because it would please him, and despite what he obviously thought, she did want to please him. That would be lovely. He nodded, deciding he would talk to his brother after church the following morning. I'll ask him then. What would you like me to fix for supper? Sunday was Mrs. Buchanan's day off, and the prospect of cooking for company was not a pleasant one. She wanted to spend as much time resting as she could, and having company would not facilitate that. He shrugged. Whatever you want to fix. It was all she could do not to throw something at him. So you get to decide we're going to have company. You get to choose who we're having over, and I get to decide what to make and do all the work. You could at least tell me what to fix. She stood up and pushed her chair in. I'm going to take a nap before supper. Jack watched her go, wondering what he'd done now. He'd tried to be civil. He'd suggested a way for them to learn to be good parents. Why wasn't she meeting him halfway? He got up and stalked back outside, barely noticing the rain had stopped. He went into the stable and talked to his favorite gelding. Anything was better than being in the house with his shrew of a wife. He'd been in there for about twenty minutes when he heard footsteps behind him. Sounds like you're having a hard day, son. His father stood behind him, reminding him of what it was to be a good husband. He was certain his parents had never fought. Especially not the way he and Beulah were fighting. I've had better. The woman makes no sense to me at all. His father smiled, leaning against a stall. You know, our first year of marriage was an absolute disaster. I was sure your mother would leave me a dozen different times. What? You and mother have a perfect marriage. No, we really don't. We have a good marriage now, but only because we've been working on our marriage for close to forty years. You've been married a little over two months. That's not enough time to even get used to living with someone else, let alone learn all of their habits. Good marriages take time, more time than I care to admit. Jack frowned. I thought she was the perfect wife. She's beautiful and intelligent, but she doesn't listen to me. I tell her to do something, and she laughs in my face. It's like she doesn't realize that I'm the one who is in charge in this marriage of ours. His father laughed. Oh, you are, are you? You have to realize that by marrying an intelligent woman, You've married someone who is used to thinking for herself. You've married someone with opinions and thoughts. Someone who will think that her way should be listened to at least as often as not. She has some good ideas simply because she's intelligent. Well, I want her to be smart, but not too smart. Jack sighed. I guess I should be thankful for the wonderful woman I'm married to instead of wanting her to change to be more like my ideal of what she should be. Yes, you really should. You found a woman who cares about you and your feelings, and she's a darn good teacher, from what everyone is telling me. She loves what she does, and she has a passion for things outside your house. When I first married your mother, she'd been painting portraits for years, and she was used to making a little money of her own. When I told her that her only focus after we married was to be me and our sons, she laughed in my face. She told me she was going to fulfill the commitments she'd made before marrying me, and that was that. Did that make you angry? Oh, yes. I was so angry, I could have spit, but I didn't because I felt the need to respect the woman my heart had chosen as well. So I did respect her, and we gradually worked things out.
By the time our third son was born, she had stopped painting portraits for the most part. She still painted you boys, of course, but she wasn't painting for money any longer. Do you think Beulah will ever get to the point that she's not feeling the need to work outside the home? Jack asked. He wanted his wife there when he got home, waiting with his slippers. Why did she feel the need to be sitting there working on schoolwork all the time? He'd heard other teachers did their preparation and grading during the school day. Why did she always bring her work home with her? I don't know, but I do know that she'll be happier if she comes to the conclusion that she wants to stay home and be with the children on her own and she doesn't feel like you're trying to force the issue. His father clapped him on the shoulder. I promise it does get easier as the two of you get to know one another better. You'll find that you get through these little obstacles along the way, and you don't remember why they seemed like such a big deal to start with. I hope you're right, father, because right now, all I can think about is sending her back to where she came from and finding one of those brainless ninnies from church and marrying her instead. Mr. McLean threw back his head and laughed. You really think you want to be married to a brainless ninny? Then why didn't you settle for one to begin with? There were half a dozen who were willing but you were always set on someone who could talk to you. And argue with you. You made the right choice. It may not feel like it today, or even tomorrow, but eventually, you'll know I'm right. I hope you are right. I don't know what to do at the moment, but I'm sure it's because we don't know each other as well as we should. I should have taken time to court her like she asked. Instead, I kissed her and told her we weren't waiting. Jack shook his head. Perhaps his beautiful, intelligent wife was right about some things. He didn't want to admit it to her, though. She'd never let him live it down. Well, hang in there, son. You're going to do just fine, as long as you both keep in mind that you're meant to be together. His father held up one hand, and before you deny you were meant to be together, I will remind you that I saw you right after you picked her up from the train station. You had a look on your face that told me you would never be the same after less than an hour with her. You two belong together, and that's that. Now, you just have to figure out how you can live together. With those words, Jack's father left the stable, and Jack stood leaning against one of the stalls. I guess my father is right whether I want him to be or not. What is it about the people around me being right all of a sudden? I want to be right. I think it's my turn, don't you? His gelding just stared at him, and Jack shrugged. I guess you don't know anything more than I do. He walked back into the house and was startled by the silence. Mrs. Buchanan had worked all day, and she left the food in the oven. She didn't stay to do dishes on Saturday nights, but that was all well and good. He needed the time with his bride, so they could talk their issues out. Her not quitting her job to stay home and be pregnant shouldn't be enough to destroy their marriage no matter how much it upset him, he sat down at the table, and he picked up a piece of paper that she'd written on. It was a letter to someone named Catalina, and he knew he shouldn't, but he read through the letter. He needed to know what she was feeling and what she was telling others. Dear Catalina, I cannot begin to express how much I miss you. I remember that you used to annoy me when you'd make sounds in the middle of the night while you were sleeping but now I would give anything to hear those sounds instead of the snores that fill my ears as I'm trying to sleep. I have just found out that I'm expecting my first child. My mother-in-law insists that it will be the first of seven boys. Apparently, I've married into a family who only gives birth to sons, and always seven of them. So that seems to be my destiny. Jack is unhappy that I'm not willing to immediately quit teaching and stay home, just watching my belly grow. I know it will grow and I'm willing for it to grow to gestate the child within me, but I have no desire to sit around and watch it happen. My students need me. I'm not sure what you found when you started your school, but here in Texas, more than half of my students didn't know how to read. Even if I'm unable to continue teaching for years and years, they will be able to read and do basic arithmetic before I'm finished with them. I just want to kick Jack at the moment. He thinks I should not work after this year if I do finish the year out, but we had talked about me hiring a nanny, so the nanny can watch the children. When I'm ready to stop working I will, but he has to understand that I'm a thinking intelligent woman, and he doesn't get to make decisions for me. I told him that on our wedding day, and I will tell him that every day for the rest of our lives. 
just because he has a penis does not mean that he gets to control me. Anyway, I hope you are well and enjoying your new husband. Please write soon so I know you are safe. It occurred to me after I left New York that moving across the country to marry an absolute stranger might not be the safest course of action. Why it didn't occur to me before that, I'll never know. I look forward to your correspondence. All my love, Beulah. Jack read through the letter once more. He knew that Catalina was the girl that Beulah had roomed with from the time they were both babies, and he was happy they were staying in touch. And he was even happier that he had read her letter to her old friend because it told him how to go from there. He would need to acknowledge her intelligence and her right to have a say in the decisions he made for her. That should appease her. He set the letter back the way it had been and wandered into the kitchen for something to drink. Yes, he was going to be able to make his wife happy, now that he knew how she was feeling. He should probably feel guilty for reading her correspondence to her friend, but he didn't. He only felt elated that he now had a course of action to follow. He picked up the book he'd begun reading earlier, with a smile. Before she knew it, she'd be eating out of his hand, like a well-trained animal. No, he wasn't calling his wife an animal, but he could see the similarities. Just a short while, and they would be seeing eye to eye once again. Hopefully before they went to bed that night, because he didn't want her to send him to the spare room, and with as headstrong as his beautiful wife was, she might do just that. Chapter 8 Supper was a silent affair that evening, since Beulah didn't respond with much more than a yes or no to any questions Jack asked. When she got up to clear the table and start the dishes, he caught her hand. I'm sorry. For what? Beulah asked, her eyes narrowing. She knew he had no idea what he was sorry for, because he didn't know why she was upset in the first place. He was apologizing because he didn't want to be sent to sleep in the barn, and he knew she was just the woman to do that very thing. Jack frowned. For upsetting you. And how exactly did you upset me? Why am I upset? Do you even know? Because I think you should listen to me and obey me like our marriage vow state, he asked, immediately regretting his words. You knew the day we married that I had no intention of ever obeying you. I told you that then. Beulah refused to stand there and argue. She walked straight into the kitchen with the dishes she carried and set them on the counter in preparation for washing them. Jack followed her into the kitchen, refusing to let things stand as they were. I should have known that an intelligent woman like you would never follow me blindly. I'm sorry I ever expected it of you. And yet, you're standing there still expecting it of me. Don't apologize for something you have no intention of changing. Go do whatever you're going to do. I need to finish up these dishes, and then I need to study. I haven't done any of my studying today, and you know how important that is to me. I wish spending time with me was half as important. He knew he was being unfair even as he said the words, but he stormed out of the kitchen anyway. The woman could make him angrier than anyone else on the face of the earth. Beulah heard the front door slam, and she was happy. She didn't want to be around him at that moment anyway. He was going to make her say or do something she'd regret, and that wasn't what she wanted. She needed to remain calm because she was growing a baby. A stupid son, apparently. As soon as the dishes were done, she sat down at the table with one of her anatomy books and looked through to find the section on pregnancy. She wanted to understand exactly what was happening within her body from a clinical standpoint. With every word she read, she felt her heart growing softer and softer. Boy or girl, the baby growing within her was something she would love and cherish. Before she knew what was happening, she was crying, full alligator tears running down her face as she thought about the child that grew within her. She truly didn't care if it was a boy or a girl. She was having a baby. A real live little human for her to hold a nurse and shape into the person he was destined to be. Whether he became a doctor or a rancher like his father, she wanted this baby with every fiber of her being. She glanced at the clock on the mantel and saw that it was only 7.30, but she was exhausted. Every bone in her body ached, and she never wanted to have to be awake again. She got up and walked up the stairs to bed, not even thinking about where Jack was. He was angry with her and maybe he deserved to be, but she deserved to be angry as well. He was a pig-headed goat of a man who needed to be taught a lesson. 
right after she'd slept for twenty hours or so. She was asleep as soon as her head hit the pillow. Jack went to his parents' house, and his mother let him have a big piece of the cake she'd made that day. Are you still fighting with Beulah? she asked. He shrugged, tucking into the cake and trying not to feel guilty about making his pregnant wife unhappy. Maybe a little. Jack, you know you're in the wrong here. Everyone knows you're in the wrong here. You cannot expect a woman with a brain in her head to follow everything you say blindly. There is nothing that's going to happen at school that will hurt her any more than would happen at home. If she quit her job, you'd no longer need Mrs. Buchanan, right? Jack nodded, not sure where she was headed with this, but the cake was awfully good, and she would probably take it from him if he didn't respond appropriately. Well, if Mrs. Buchanan was no longer working for you, then Beulah would be doing harder, more difficult work at home than she does at school. Why not let her continue to teach? But that's work she should be doing. Because we're married and she's supposed to do the laundry and fix the meals. Not some woman we pay to do it. His mother took the cake from him. There was only half of it left, but she grabbed the plate and put it out of his reach. Just like he'd suspected she would. Why? Why is it her job to do it and not yours? Don't you think she should be allowed to teach if teaching makes her happy? He shrugged. I guess. Are you just agreeing with me so I'll give you the cake back? She asked, her eyes narrowed. Well, yes. I want my cake. Jack sighed. Mother, I don't know why you're upset about this. I told her that I wanted her to stop working now that she's having a baby. She got to teach an entire month, and her goal is to start a school where all children would be included. She wants this school to go on and on. One month doesn't begin to be enough. Neither is one year. This will be her legacy and the legacy of the woman who raised her. You need to keep that in your head. What if you were told you could only be a rancher for one month? Or one year, and then you had to stay home with the children? But I'm a man. Of course I can't stay home with the children. She shook her head. You weren't beaten enough as a child. Obviously. Maybe I'll have your father rectify that now. His father looked over at his wife and youngest son. I'm willing. Just give me my cake back. Jack knew they'd never beat him. They'd hardly ever spanked any of their boys. This cake? His mother asked, holding it toward him. When Jack reached for it, she snatched it back. You're going to go home and tell your wife she has the right to teach, just as long as she wants to teach. Aren't you? Jack glared at her. You're trying to bribe me with cake? Is it working? Jack sighed. Yeah, it's working. I'll talk to her in the morning after she's had time to sleep off a little bit of her mad. That woman gets angrier than anyone I've ever met. She slid the cake back to him. I'd better hear that you talked to her and told her she doesn't need to stop teaching. Jack said nothing as he continued eating. He didn't lie. He never had. His power made him understand the importance of truth too much. When he had finished the cake, he and his father sat and played a card game for a while before he decided to go home. He wasn't looking forward to his reception there. When he got home, he found his wife curled on one side, her hand covering her stomach. She was sound asleep, obviously not agonizing over their fight that day as he was. He undressed and got into bed beside her, pulling her close. She was the most infuriating woman alive, but he loved her anyway. Hopefully they'd be able to move past all of this. When Beulah woke on Sunday morning, her limbs were entangled with Jack's. She stared at him for a moment, wondering when he'd come home. The man made her crazy, but he was only doing what most men thought they should do. She slipped from the bed, thankful her stomach wasn't in an uproar that morning, and she went downstairs to cook breakfast. When Jack came down to join her, she was putting their food on the table. Are you still angry with me? he asked. She shrugged, more hurt than angry. Sleeping for as long as she had did wonders for her temper. I'll be all right. I'm not going to fight with you about continuing teaching for the rest of the school year. Her eyes narrowed. And next year? He walked toward her, folding his arms around her. One fight at a time, 
we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. She nodded, resting her head on his shoulder. Where did you go last night? To my parents' house. You'll be happy to know that my mother thinks I'm wrong, and she told me I wasn't beaten enough as a child. Beulah hit a giggle. She didn't believe in corporal punishment, but in his case, it may have been necessary. You think that's funny? Jack asked, not truly upset with her. You think it's funny that my mother is considering beating me over this? She shrugged. Well, I think you were wrong, and I'm glad she agrees with me. Jack closed his eyes, fighting down his anger. Whether he'd been wrong or not, she shouldn't be telling him he was. She was his wife after all. I'll try not to take exception to that. Good. She yawned. Are you still planning to invite your brother and his family over for supper tonight? She had no idea what she would make if she did. He shook his head. I don't think so. After the way we lost an entire Saturday fighting with each other, I just want to spend the time alone with you. She smiled, resting her forehead against his shoulder. I think that's a wonderful idea, it's still nice out, and we could go for a walk. Or for a buggy ride. Do you know I haven't been farther from this house than the church since we moved here? Are there no neighboring towns? Nothing to go see? We'll go for a buggy ride then. That sounds like a good way for us to spend the day. Do you need to do any work today? Beulah thought about the papers that still needed to be graded, but he was right. They needed to have a day together with nothing between them. Nothing that won't wait. Really? Jack's face lit up. You're going to put off some work for me? She laughed. Well, you are my husband. I can ignore grading papers until tomorrow morning if it gets me a little more time alone with you. Pack a picnic then. We'll go for that drive after church, and we'll picnic while we're out. That sounds lovely. And it did. The two of them were both always so busy, her with teaching and him with running the ranch, that they rarely had much time to spend together. She was going to enjoy today, because it meant that for now, their marriage was all right again. It might not be after their son was born, but hopefully by then he'd see reason. He grinned, feeling like a little boy. A whole day with nothing to do but church. I'm not sure I can handle the excitement. I'm not sure you can either. But you should try. She hurried into the kitchen and packed them a quick and easy lunch, consisting of ham slices, cheese, and bread. If that wasn't good enough, then he could eat grass. She was glad they weren't fighting any longer, but she wasn't going to bend over backward to please him either. Soon they were ready for church, and he hitched up the buggy. Normally they just drove the wagon, but the buggy was so much nicer for a long drive. She put the picnic basket on the back seat, and they drove to church. His mother came over to her as soon as they arrived. Did you two talk? Beulah nodded, blushing a little. How many people knew about her fight with Jack? Yes, we talked first thing this morning. Good. I'm glad things are settled between you. Mary smiled and kissed Beulah's cheek. You're everything I could ask for in a wife for my Jack. I do believe he's my Jack now, Beulah responded, her eyes twinkling. I think you may be right about that. Mary moved on then, knowing that many of the parents of Beulah's pupils would want to speak with her. As Beulah talked to all the parents one after the other, she was always aware of where Jack was in the church. The man could make her spitting mad, but he could also make her purr like a kitten. Perhaps that was what was meant by love. After church, Jack took Beulah's hand and rushed her out of the building, hoping they would be able to escape before she was once again surrounded by the children she taught and their parents. Why she was suddenly the most popular woman in church, he would never know. As soon as they were to the buggy, he gave her a winning smile. We did it. Beulah frowned. What exactly did we just do? We got away before you were forced to tell parents for two hours straight about their little darling's behavior during school. We got out, and now we get to spend our day together. She laughed softly. Did you ever think that maybe I had a parent I still needed to talk to? Doesn't matter, we're going for a drive. He flicked the reins, and they headed in the direction of nowhere, one of his favorite places. The town was small, about the same size as Bagley, 
but there was something special about it. Did you have someone you needed to talk to? No, I didn't. I just wondered what you would do if I had. Would you have turned around? Not on your life. You'd have had to send the parent a note home. I'm not lollygagging for anyone. Not today. He grinned over at her. This drive today is going to have to serve as our honeymoon. She laughed. We can't have a honeymoon when I'm already expecting. Silly man. She realized he'd gone from a pig-headed goat to a silly man in the space of eighteen hours. She grinned to herself as she contemplated telling him about his elevation in the world. As they drove, he pointed out different things. I used to play baseball there with my friends. Then at another place, there's a man who lives in those woods. I don't think he's bathed in fifteen years. The stench is pretty bad. And when they got into nowhere, there's the mercantile where I shop for anything other than the absolute basics. They have a better selection here than at the mercantile in Bagley. Once they were through nowhere, he pulled off to the side of the road. I wish we were doing this in the springtime when all the flowers were in bloom, but I guess being here in the autumn has its appeal as well. When do the leaves start changing? she asked. You won't find there's as much color to the leaves here as you'd have had back in New York. This is the best part of Texas for fall colors, though. In a couple of weeks, there will be a little color to the trees. Fall has always been my favorite time of year, she said wistfully. I love that it's getting cooler and school is back in session. Even as a girl I preferred going to school to being off for the summer. I guess that makes me just a little bit odd. It probably does, he said with a grin. But I love how odd you are. I love you, he added silently, but he wasn't ready yet to give her the words. He wasn't ready for her to have that much power over him. She made a face at him, let's have our picnic. She got down from the buggy more carefully than usual, aware of the child growing within her. She didn't want to risk a fall. Carefully spreading the quilt she'd brought for their picnic, she put the basket with their food in it atop. I didn't have time to put something fabulous together. We're just having cheese, ham, and bread. I hope that's all right. Will I get to eat it while gazing into your beautiful eyes? he asked. He knew he was laying it on a little thicker than he probably should be, but he had to make up for yesterday. He wanted her to be happy and no longer ready to throw him off a roof. Absolutely, she said, smiling at him. In fact. She leaned forward and kissed him softly. Your sweet words have earned you a kiss. I wonder what I'd need to do to earn more than a kiss. She laughed. You'd have to take me home for starters. There may be no one in sight, but this is a public road, and I can't see myself being willing to do anything like what you're thinking with anyone around us. You know what I'm thinking? he asked, pretending to be surprised, and here I thought I was the one with a special power. Yes, but it doesn't take much to be able to read a picture book, and your mind. Well, a picture book is the only way I can begin to describe reading it. He laughed. You are something else, Beulah McLean. You're pretty special yourself. Chapter 9 As time went by, Beulah was sleeping more, but still trying to get the same amount done she had been. She gave up on studying her anatomy and simply tried to keep her head above water where schoolwork was concerned. She'd heard that pregnancy made a woman tired, but she couldn't believe just how tired she was. Having the ability to thrive on only four hours of sleep was something she'd always prided herself on. Now she needed at least ten hours per night or she was almost completely unable to function. By the beginning of December, she no longer had to worry about morning sickness, but the extra sleep she needed more than made up for it. She found herself napping during recess at times, and once forgot to call the children back into the building for more than an hour. The first weekend in December, Jack was moping around the house, obviously upset that he wasn't getting enough time with her, which had become a common refrain throughout their marriage. She was still asleep well past mid-morning, and he sat down on the side of the bed, watching her sleep. Are you all right? he asked when she opened her eyes to look at him. She reached out and took his hand, feeling badly that he was worried about her. I'm fine. I'm just so tired. Growing this baby is sucking every little bit of energy I have. 
I feel like we never have any time together anymore. He felt like he was a little boy whining as he begged for a crumb of affection from a busy parent, but it was crazy that they were married and spent so little time together. She propped herself up on one elbow, thinking about all the papers she still needed to grade and the planning she needed to do for that week of school. I'll have time off for the Christmas holidays soon. We'll be able to spend lots of time together then. She would only work on grading and planning while he was out working, and the rest of the time would be for him. And sleeping. There needed to be lots of time for sleeping. Mrs. Buchanan already cleaned up from breakfast, and she said lunch would be ready in an hour. Do you want me to fix a bath for you? He wanted to pamper her and make her feel special, but he just didn't know how. No, thank you. I'll take one tonight. She hid a yawn behind her hand. I'm sorry I'm always so sleepy. I feel like every time we have time to be alone together, I fall asleep. Is it still spending time together if you are reading a book and I'm sleeping in the chair beside you? He smiled at that. I guess I can understand why you're so tired. You are growing another person inside you. He got to his feet. You'll come down for lunch? Yes, I'm just going to sleep a few more minutes, and then I'll get up and get dressed. Let's drive into town this afternoon. We can pick up our mail and get any supplies we need. She nodded, her eyes already drifting closed again. Soon. Jack looked down at her with a sad look on his face. It was hard to believe she preferred sleep to spending time with him. They'd only been married a few months. She barely made it downstairs in time for lunch, and Mrs. Buchanan smiled at her. That baby is making you sleepy. Beulah nodded. I've always heard that expecting made you really tired, but I had no idea it would be this bad. I feel like all I do is eat and sleep. And work, Jack added. Don't forget you work. I do work. But don't worry. We'll spend the afternoon together today. And I won't work at all this evening. But then you'll spend all day tomorrow, catching up on what you didn't do today, he asked. He felt like he was in direct competition with her job, and it was making him crazy. She frowned. No, I won't work at all tomorrow. We'll go to church, have a nice lunch, and then we can nap together all afternoon. He saw that Mrs. Buchanan had left the room, so he said what was really on his mind. If I thought you meant just spend the afternoon in bed, I'd be all for it, but you really do mean nap. I cannot begin to describe the level of bone-deep tired I'm feeling. It's as if I've been trying to climb a mountain and I keep slipping down the side, and then I climb the same spot again. Beulah yawned behind her hand. I want to take a week-long nap, and then get up and take another. There's not enough hours in the day to sleep all I need to sleep. Have you seen a doctor? Maybe there's something wrong with you that you are so tired. Beyond expecting, I mean. I haven't. Not yet anyway. Maybe it's time for me to make an appointment and try to figure out what's going on with me. Beulah shook her head. Why don't I cancel school for Monday and plan to go then? I think I need an extra day off anyway. He nodded. I think that would be really smart. And truthfully, he wanted her to tear herself away from her school more. It was hard to believe how jealous he was of a couple of dozen children. I'll put the word out at church tomorrow. As she ate, she thought about how badly she wanted to climb back into her bed. This couldn't be normal, could it? When they drove into town later, they happened to see the doctor out. He was clutching his black bag and about to climb into his buggy. Jack called out to him, and he walked over to them instead. Jack, how are you? I'm doing very well. It's my wife I wanted to talk to you about. She's expecting, as you can see, and she's sleeping all the time. That's pretty normal, son. I don't think this much is normal, Beulah said. I'm sorry, but I've spent a great deal of time studying medicine. I have always been able to exist on four or five hours of sleep per night, but now my body wants more like eighteen hours of sleep. I wake up tired, and I do everything all day tired. I'm even sleeping during recesses and have forgotten to call the children back into school several times. The doctor frowned at that. You have? That does seem a bit excessive. Now I don't want you to worry your pretty little head about it, 
Can you come and see me on Monday morning? Beulah nodded. I had just decided to cancel school for the day. What time? Let's say ten. But don't bring your husband. Can you come in with your mother-in-law? Yes, of course, but why don't you want Jack there? Men don't belong anywhere around childbirth. Surely you know that. The doctor walked off then, leaving Beulah frowning after him. He's certainly old-fashioned. What is his name? Dr. Murphy. He's a good man, but yes, he does have some interesting ideas. I'm just glad you'll be able to see him so soon. Maybe we can get to the bottom of what's wrong with you. Beulah nodded, already half asleep again. When they went into the mercantile, she realized she had done no sewing for the baby, and the only chance she would really get was during the Christmas break. She was ready to cry just thinking of all that still had to be done, but she kept her chin up. Reaching for different fabrics, she chose several to make sleepers for the baby. Perhaps Mary would be willing to help her with her sewing as well. How could she possibly keep up and teach school at the same time? When they left the store, Beulah asked softly, Do you mind if we stop by your parents' house on the way home? I have a couple of questions for your mother. Of course not. He flicked the leads and turned the buggy around, heading toward the ranch. Hopefully his mother would have the answers, because after talking to Dr. Murphy, he was certain that man didn't have any answers for her. Thirty minutes later, Beulah was seated at her mother-in-law's dining room table, drinking tea and eating cookies. Jack and his father were out somewhere doing something. She had no idea what, nor did she care. There's something wrong with me, Beulah said softly. It's more than just expecting. I'm so tired. I cannot keep my eyes open, no matter what I do. I slept a good fifteen hours last night, which is ridiculous, and still I'm too tired to stay awake. Mary frowned. You need to see Samantha Jeffries. She's the local midwife. I have an appointment with Dr. Murphy on Monday. You don't want to see Dr. Murphy for pregnancy. The man is. Not good with women. You want to see Samantha. She'll know what to do right away. She's delivered hundreds of babies over the years. No one will go to Doc Murphy. Beulah was surprised by that. I've always thought that a doctor would be better than a midwife for delivering babies. Maybe if there's something wrong with you, but for a healthy pregnancy, you really do want Samantha. You will get no sympathy from the doctor. He'll just keep telling you that's the curse women have to bear for Eve's sin. He did seem the type. Beulah shook her head. I'll see him, and if his answers don't satisfy me, I'll go see Samantha. That sounds like a smart compromise. Mary took Beulah's hand. How are you doing with preparing? Are you getting your sewing done? Beulah shook her head, feeling tears pop into her eyes. I've just realized that I am spending so much time working and sleeping that I've done nothing at all to get ready for the baby. I'm walking around growing a child that will have nothing to wear. Mary smiled. I had a feeling that would be the case. I'll go ahead and call all my daughters-in-law together, and we'll get some sewing done for you. You shouldn't have to teach and sew, you can do one or the other. I sure wish Jack felt that way. He seems to feel like I'm letting him and the baby down by not getting enough done. Beulah rubbed the back of her neck, feeling defeated. I need another twenty hours in the day to do all I need to do and spend time with my husband. I'm frustrating Jack because I'm always busy or sleeping. Jack cares for you, so he wants you to have time for him. That's understandable. It is. But I have no time. I decided to take today off and grade no papers and not prepare for school so I can spend some time with him, but that means that I'll need to do more Monday. I have to find the time to do my work somewhere. Are you still able to do the studying you feel so strongly about? Mary asked, her eyes on Beulah's face. Beulah shook her head. No, I have no time for that or anything else. I'm doing good to take the time to brush my hair in the mornings. I'm going to make sure you get the help you need, Mary said. How about if I find someone who can help you grade papers as well? Do you know someone who could do that? Don't you worry. I believe Edna will be able to help you. I'll talk to her and see if she can find some time for you. 
Edna was Jack's third oldest brother's wife. It was all Beulah could do to keep track of the relations, but she was managing somehow. That would please me more than anything. I know I'm letting Jack down, but I don't want to keep working this hard. If I can get just a little help, or a whole lot of help, I can keep teaching. We're not going to have trouble getting help for you. Everyone in town is thrilled we finally have a teacher and a school, and no one is willing to let you go just because you're expecting. On the drive home from his parents' house, Beulah briefly told Jack about how his mother was going to help. I'm glad I thought to ask her. She seems to know everyone around here. Of course she does. She was born and raised in nowhere. This isn't a large area. Everyone knows everyone else. Give yourself a little time and you'll know everyone as well. Once they were home, she yawned again, and he sighed. Get a nap. I'll wake you up for supper. No, I don't want to give up our time together. Well, I suppose I could sit and watch you nap, but that might be odd for both of us. Don't worry, I'll be able to keep myself occupied. You need your sleep. As she climbed the stairs, he watched her, a frown on his face. All of a sudden, he was worried about her health. It had always been the baby, but now that she was barely coherent, he knew there was something that needed to be fixed. Soon. On Monday morning, Mary was there to take Beulah to the doctor. Are you ready? Beulah nodded. I hate putting you out to take me. I have no idea why the doctor said that Jack wasn't allowed to go with me to an appointment with him. Because Dr. Murphy is an idiot, you'll see, and then we'll move on to someone who can really help you. Beulah stubbornly refused to believe anyone about Dr. Murphy. She knew all about the training a doctor received, and it was hard to believe any doctor could possibly act the way Dr. Murphy was accused of acting. When they got to town, Beulah carefully got down out of the wagon Mary drove and walked to the door of the doctor's office. As soon as the doctor had her in the examining room, he asked her some basic questions. How far along do you think you are? I think about four months, and you're still feeling exhaustion, is that correct? Dr. Murphy looked up from the paper he was making notes on. Yes, that's right. I am sleeping at least three times as much as usual. It's ridiculous. It sounds to me like you're using this pregnancy as an excuse to be slothful. Have you always resented working? Do you hate having to do your chores? Beulah felt her jaw drop. Slothful? She used the small step to get down off the examination table. Good day, Dr. Murphy. Mary was right behind her as she left the building. Dr. Murphy yelled after them. You're still going to have to pay for this examination. Beulah stared straight ahead, refusing to even look at the man. If you'll take me to Samantha, I'd greatly appreciate it. Mary hid her smile as she got into the wagon beside her daughter-in-law. I would love to. Samantha is expecting us. You were that sure of me? I know Dr. Murphy that well. I won't even take a broken bone to him, and we drive to nowhere to the doctor there when we need one. Dr. Murphy is evil to the very core of his being. Beulah shook her head. After all the learning I'd done about the medical profession and becoming a doctor, I couldn't believe any doctor would treat people that way. I'm very sorry for not taking your advice to begin with. Mary drove through town, to a small house on the outskirts, and she jumped down, hurrying to the door. A woman who must have been in her seventies, with a huge smile and gray hair falling in tendrils around her face, invited them both in. I hear you're having trouble with exhaustion, Samantha said, looking Beulah up and down. I think you need to take something called yellow dock root, you'll steep it into a tea. She walked to a carpet bag that was on the floor near her table. Here's a small pouch of it. Now, do you want me to examine you? Do you need to? Samantha shook her head. Not if you're not feeling poorly other than the exhaustion. We can fix that up in no time, and you'll be back to your regular, active schedule. Does that sound good to you? It sounds wonderful, Beulah said, feeling very relieved. How many times a day should I drink it? Once in the morning, and once around midday. You shouldn't need it at night. You're the new teacher, right? Beulah nodded. I am. 
I think you should do half days of school until after Christmas. That'll give the medicine time to kick in, and then you should feel more like yourself for your teaching after. I'm sure the parents won't mind. Beulah looked over at Mary, who nodded emphatically. All right. I'll let everyone know tomorrow. Good girl. Now, I'm going to want to see you right after the new year, and we'll talk again then. You have Mary to help you, and I can promise you that you'll need no one else. She's been through all this enough herself that she's practically a midwife, and she's been present for the birth of every one of her grandbabies. Will you be there for me, Mary? Beulah felt bad for asking, but she needed someone who knew what she was doing. You couldn't keep me away. During her lunch hour on Tuesday, Beulah was struggling to stay awake so she could grade a few papers. One of Jack's nieces, Alice, came into the schoolhouse, looking at her hesitantly. May I ask you a question, Aunt Beulah? Beulah immediately gave her full attention to the young girl. Of course you can. Well, I know you study a lot, and I've seen books on the human body at your house when we visited. I think I want to be a doctor. Do you think a girl can be a doctor? Beulah's eyes lit up. I do think a girl can be a doctor. In fact, I kind of think my sister Xenia, who disappeared, secretly went to medical school. She was certainly smart enough to do it. Would you loan me some of your books? I want to learn all I can. I'm not sure my father will approve, but I know my mama will. Beulah grinned. Then you can borrow any book you'd like. I think you'd make a fine doctor. After Alice had hurried back out to the playground, Beulah wondered if the young girl could be a doctor or not. She certainly hoped so. There were too many male doctors who acted like Dr. Murphy. The world needed doctors more like Samantha. She sighed as she got back to work, her mind still a bit on Xenia. She hoped she was passing all of her classes. One of them should get to be a doctor, and if it couldn't be her, why not Xenia? Chapter 10 Slowly through the month of December, Beulah returned to her normal self. Well, her normal self with a watermelon under the front of her dress. The babe was growing, and she was finally feeling like she'd had enough sleep. By Christmas, most things were back to how they had been. On Christmas Eve, she sat finishing up a gift for Jack while he was out in the barn doing something. She suspected it was something for her for Christmas. She was knitting Jack a pair of warm socks for the winter to go with the new shirt she'd made him, she was sure he'd be happy she'd spent time doing something just for him. She had just finished wrapping the present when Mrs. Buchanan came into the parlor from the kitchen. I have your supper ready. I'll see you the day after tomorrow. Beulah smiled at the older woman, nodding. Thank you so much for your help. I don't know what I'd have done without you these past few months. She knew that a nice bonus had been included for the other woman's salary. I hope you have a very Merry Christmas. You too. It'll be different with a real family this year. As Mrs. Buchanan left, Beulah thought about what the other woman had said. She'd never felt as if she was lacking for sisters or parental figures. Sure, she'd never had true parents, and it was lovely to get some through her marriage to Jack, but she felt as if the people she had known in her time at the foundling home had been her real family. She had letters from the three girls she considered to be her sisters, and she had one from Madame Wig. They were still sealed, and she looked forward to reading them on Christmas morning. Beulah knew it wasn't a traditional family she'd come from but it had been a family nonetheless, and it was a family she loved. When Jack came into the house a few minutes later, she met him at the table, and the two of them sat down for their supper. You really do look better than you did for a while there, he said. Are you saying I was something less than beautiful? Never. I'm saying you were a very pretty sickly-looking, beautiful woman. She laughed. You are ever the sweet talker, aren't you? She would need to remember to teach each of her sons how to talk to a woman properly. They didn't need to be as backward as their father was. That tea you're drinking seems to have helped. Oh, yes. I'm still sleeping more than I did, but I'm not sleeping an excessive amount, and I've learned that Dr. Murphy is not a man I will ever see in a professional capacity again. He nodded. I had never heard of anyone seeing him for a pregnancy, but I didn't know why. I can tell you why. 
The man is insane. Our children will never darken his doorstep. She took a sip of the milk she was having with her meal. So everyone is coming here in the morning, right? Jack nodded. You're not expected to do anything but host it all. You don't even have to cook, because all of the women in the family will cook different dishes and bring them for lunch. All you have to do is stand there and look pretty. They'll even clean up before they go. So why meet here? Beulah didn't quite understand the whole thing, but she'd agreed because it was expected of her. Because this is where my brothers and I grew up. And my father as well for that matter. Holidays will always be here, in this house. All right. She ate a bite of her roast beef, enjoying the flavors. Mrs. Buchanan was a fabulous cook, even better than Beulah was, and that was saying something. If you're amenable, I thought the two of us could wake up early and exchange our gifts, and then we'll spend the rest of the day with my entire family. Even my brother who lives in Austin will be coming with his family. You haven't met Joe yet, have you? I haven't. It'll be fun to meet new people. Now that she finally had the names of the rest of the family down, she was willing to meet a few more people. At first, they had been very overwhelming, but it wasn't nearly as bad now. I ordered several picture books for your nieces and nephews. Seventeen to be exact. But I only have sixteen nieces and nephews, he said, looking perplexed. Well, I had to get one to keep for our son. She patted her belly, reminding him once again that there was a baby to be born in a mere four months or so. What are we going to name him? What about John? It's a name I've always liked, and many have assumed it was my name, but my full name really is Jack, not John. She tilted her head to one side and thought about it for a moment. John sounds good to me, yes, we'll name this one John. He smiled. I'm glad you don't mind. I have been thinking about names a lot, and for some reason, that's the one that kept popping into my head. Besides, if I name this one, you can name the next. Seven Sons You really believe we're having seven sons? She was still a bit flabbergasted when she thought about the number. He shrugged. That's how it's always been in my family. I suppose it could change without warning, but I really don't see that happening. Beulah looked down at her huge belly. So I'm going to do this six more times. We need to invest in a company that uses yellow dock medicinally. He grinned. Maybe we should. I don't want you being that tired for all of your other pregnancies as well. The following morning, they had a quiet breakfast, and then they met in the parlor, where she'd set up a small tree. I know it's strange to have a tree in the house, but it's something that I learned back in New York. It felt like a festive thing to do. He shrugged. It might be odd, but I think I like it. This is our first Christmas together, and we can choose whatever traditions we want to carry on with. This is one I think is very nice. She pulled two packages, wrapped in brown paper and tied with strings, out from under the tree. She set them onto a small table in the middle of the room. For you, she said, her eyes lit up with excitement. Let me go get yours. It'll take me two trips. You stay right here. Beulah couldn't imagine anything he could have made her, or gotten her, that would take two trips for him to fetch, and her mind ran away with her. Perhaps he'd gotten her a wardrobe and a chest to keep it in. She giggled at the idea. He knew better. She was not a woman who cared about clothing very much. She heard the front door open. I'll be right back he called, and then it closed again. The man was making her imagination do very strange things. What on earth could he have thought she needed that needed two trips to the barn? When he came back, he said, All right, cover your eyes. I'm bringing something in. Beulah laughed, but she covered her eyes, waiting to see what he'd bring. When he told her to open them, he stood beside a beautiful cradle, with carved animals at the head and foot. Oh my! Did you make that? Jack nodded, I love to carve things. Maybe that's something you didn't know about me. It is. Why do I never see anything you've carved around the house? I usually carve animals for my nieces and nephews. They bring them all when they play together, and it's a veritable zoo. She grinned. 
That sounds wonderful. Now you open one of your gifts. She couldn't wait for him to see the socks she'd knitted. Knitting had never been one of her favorite things, but she was willing to spend her time doing something she detested for him. Only for him. He opened the socks and rubbed them against his face, they're soft. And the needlework is beautiful. Thank you. He leaned down and pressed a kiss to her forehead. You used some of your time to make something for me, and that means a lot to me, because I know time is the most precious thing you have. I'm glad you like them. Her eyes went back to the cradle. I'm going to be afraid to put a baby to sleep in that. It's so beautiful. It has to last through seven babies, so it had to be well made, he told her, a grin lighting up his face. He obviously liked that she was so impressed by it. Okay, cover your eyes again, she smiled, covering her eyes. When he let her open them again, she let out a small gasp. A bookshelf? It was the most beautiful bookshelf she'd ever seen. It was eight shelves high and went almost to the ceiling. For my anatomy books? Yes. I thought you'd like a place to keep them all where they'd be easy to reference. He pointed to the corner of the parlor. The shelf will go there, and I made certain to match it to the rest of the furniture in the room. It's wonderful. Thank you so much, Jack. The first gift had been beautiful and practical, but this gift, well, it showed he knew her. She got up and walked to him, wrapping her arms around him. You've given me so much, and it's hard to believe that you made beautiful furniture for me, too. Now if I can just convince you to let me teach for as long as I want. He smiled, tracing her lip with a fingertip. I've already decided to let you do just that. As long as you drink that special tea whenever you're expecting. I think you can teach forever if that's what you'd like. She looked up at him with wide eyes. You mean it? I do mean it. I trust you to do what's best for you and whatever baby you happen to be carrying, and you know you'll be carrying a lot of them. I love you, Beulah, and I want you to do whatever it takes to be happy. You love me? She stared at him in surprise, the words completely unexpected. Even though I don't do what you tell me to do? I understand that having a thinking wife makes it so she's not as obedient as a non-thinking wife. And I love that brain in your head. It makes you who you are. She laughed. That was not the romantic declaration of love that I've been dreaming of, but it'll do. You've been dreaming of a romantic declaration of love? He asked, surprised. I have. Because I love you, Jack. I love you so very much. That doesn't mean that I'll spend my life following you around like a lost puppy dog, because I'm an intelligent, thinking woman with a brain you love. But I love you with everything inside me. He wrapped his arms around her and lifted her off her feet. That wasn't the romantic declaration of love I've been dreaming about either, you know. Whatever, it was the declaration you needed. Wasn't it? He laughed and nodded. It was. When my mother told me I had a bride coming, I prayed and prayed that she'd be the right woman for me, and I know God answers prayers, because he sent me you. There's no one who could be more right for me than you are, Beulah. She rested her cheek against his shoulder for a moment, before she remembered her other gift for him. Oh. She turned and picked up the gift and handed it to him. It's not a bookshelf, but it was stitched with love. He opened the present and looked at the shirt inside, holding it up to himself. It was a work shirt, made of thick flannel. It would be perfect for the long winter days out on the range. Thank you, my love. You are very welcome. She couldn't believe that in just six months, she'd fallen in love with a total stranger. She needed to remember to thank his mother and write a letter to Madam Wig to thank her as well. I'm going to clean up the breakfast dishes before our company comes. He sighed. I guess you need to, but I was hoping I could drag you back upstairs. Beulah laughed, not knowing we have company coming any minute. You've lost your mind. Jack shrugged. It was worth a try. No, it really wasn't, she said, grinning at him as she rushed to the kitchen. When she got there, she found him right behind her. He had a dish towel and was ready to dry. Are you sure? she asked. I can do it myself. 
Of course you can, but a loving, considerate husband will help his wife with household chores when she is more than five months pregnant. I guess he will. With a smile, she washed the first of the dishes, saying a quick silent prayer of gratitude that God had answered both of their prayers. Epilogue Beulah woke as soon as the door to her bedroom opened, and she sat up in bed. Who's there? she asked. It's me. Tom, her youngest son replied. I had a dream. Tom didn't wait for an invitation, but he climbed into bed, squeezing himself between his parents. At five, he was a little old for his nocturnal visits, but since he was her seventh and youngest son, Beulah hadn't been able to bring herself to stop him yet. What was your dream? she asked, holding the little boy close to her. Jack had rolled to his side and propped his head up on one elbow, to listen. He was the most doting father she had ever seen, and it made parenting so much easier. Tell us about it, Tom. Well, I was old. Almost as old as you two are, and I was in a mercantile. Not the mercantile here in town, but I think the one in nowhere. Anyway, at that mercantile, there was a beautiful young woman named Penny, who was a seamstress, and she's going to be my wife. Beulah looked over at Jack. They had been waiting for a power to manifest in their youngest son. Could this be it? Are you sure she's going to be your wife? As sure as I am that the sun will rise in the morning. I can tell the future, Mama. I see that. You'll have to tell me about it every time you have a dream about what will happen, all right? Tom nodded. I'm going back to my bed now. And I'm going to dream of Penny. Once the little boy had gone and the door had clicked shut, Beulah looked over at Jack. Do you think that's his power? I do. He seemed so sure that the dream was prophetic, and that tells me it was. I never had a doubt that I was right when I thought people were lying to me. It's the way of the Maclean's. I'm not sure how I feel about him having the gift of foresight. Do you think it will serve him well? Jack shrugged. All of our powers seem to be for the best. I'm sure Tom's will be, too. He reached out and pulled Beulah toward him, stroking her arm. Are you sure you're going to teach again? Don't you think it's time to stop? She shrugged. I'm sure. Where would Mrs. Buchanan be without her job, and where would you be without all the children? Jack smiled. As long as it makes you happy. So happy. Beulah leaned over and kissed him, content to be married to her Jack. Fifteen years of marriage, and she hadn't killed him yet. She was sure it would last now, 